Hello, everyone. Hey, guys. How's Hello. it going? Oh. And, and how was that new theme song oh, that just so played for you So new. Wow. Oh. Wow. New Year's resolution was new year, new theme. Am I oh. right, Nathan? Oh, great. And well done, Brenton. You put all that together. So I'm very happy with you. Oh, hey. <laughs> oh, hey. Hey, hey. It, oh. was a, it was a team effort. This is this has been a team effort, this show. I won't be hearing, no, Brenton did all the work because I didn't. You know what I mean? This no. is a team effort and it takes one Brenton and one Nathan to make classic movie banter. You know that show where we talk, where we talk about movies that are 20 years or older and we tell you whether they're still worth watching today or whether they're worth throwing them back into the last decade. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Brenton, well done. We're all here. It's a brand new decade. I'm very excited. And we've got so many new things to talk about. But before we get into the new, Brenton, we're looking back into the old. Well, here's the thing, Nathan. Before mm. you get your hopes up, ladies and gentlemen, you've obviously read the title of the episode. We're not reviewing a film today. No. <laughs> so, if you're, so if you're new to the podcast, we're so sorry, but we're going to actually not talk about the, the, the movies of old. We're talking, you will have to, we're talking about the new. <laughs> exactly. You'll have to wait until next week, unfortunately. Yeah. But that's okay, because we're going to break our 20-year rule this week. We are. And we're going to look at the films that... Uh, were released in 2019, and you're going to hear our thoughts about them. We're going to have a good time today. It's going to be a very different episode of the podcast. We've got a bunch of different sections that we're going to go through with you listeners. We're going to go on a theme park ride of sorts. It's going to be absolutely Buckle wild. on in. Get ready to have a shitty photo taken as you go down the drop. And here we go, Brent. And we're going to walk through the year of 2019. So Nathan, step me through the process of how we're going to go on this theme park ride. So right. I'm buckling myself in now, but what's what's the first part of the ride? <laughs> tell me. You're buckling yourself me. in and you're noticing the very shotty safety standards of this ride. <laughs> you're like, Nathan, get me out of here. <laughs> well, I'm one wondering why it was actually just like a piece of rope which I've literally just tied myself around and then I've realized <laughs> that that rope isn't actually tied to a chair or anything it's just like it's just wrapped around my waist like a belt so oh uh, I'm a bit worried <laughs> but uh, so Nathan what exactly is this ride doing so what we're going to do today Brenton is that we've got a couple things you and I want to jump through last year we looked back at the year in our personal lives but this year we're sticking straight to movies and we've got a couple ideas of what we want to do with the movies of this year first off I thought we'd start off by thinking what the premise would be for a 2019 movie. So what would be the most 2019 movie? If someone in the year 2040 were to go, you know what, let's do a nostalgic movie and set a film in the year 2019. Remember that year? What would they okay. make for that movie? You know? So, okay. Okay. Brenton, okay. I want to hear from you a pitch. <laughs> I want you to pitch me a movie set in 2019. Here we go, guys. This is my pitch. Uh, so I'm in the I'm in the executive's op- office, you know. I'm I'm at I'm at some, some big company, and I'm sitting in there, and I'm very nervous. And I step up to to say my pitch, and that is, "Hey guys, my name is Brenton, and I want you to think of what audiences would love in today's cinema going age." Yes. And I have the answer for you. The story starts as we follow a young girl, okay, mm-hmm. a young female lead who is also strong. Okay. Ooh, very, okay. very strong. Very, very you know? strong. And female. Very, very strong. And how? Like think like think female and strong, but I mean like not not even in just like a physical sense, in a mental st- stance as well. So mm-hmm. imagine like Hulk Hogan but female. You know what I mean? That's that's <laughs> that's our protagonist. I'm seeing it. Okay. Okay, and before we can actually establish anything in our plot or anything that's going to happen, we're just going to keep cutting, you know? We're just going to keep cutting and keep oh, yes. the scenes flowing. We're just going to keep the scenes flowing from one to the other. And of we're course. just going to keep it so fast-paced, you know? Usually, you you know, you'd open a film, you mm. know, with some exposition, you know, or, or just, like, something to get us into the world. Of None course. of that shit, man. We're <laughs> starting off with a fucking action scene, you know what I mean? We're starting Ooh. off with a huge action scene. And it involves lots of uh lots of panning, lots of cutting, lots of sword fighting, lots Ooh. of shit. Just throw it on the screen. The more shit the better. Nathan, can you name me some shit? Name me something that would just uh, out of the blue, like a circumstance. Okay, let's just like say say they're throwing iPhones at the main protagonist. Exactly, that is in, and at the same time, the main protagonist is having a sword fight with the antagonist of the film, uh, yeah. who she also, yep, yeah, you know what I mean. Like that's all happening at once, and so it just we're just cutting, you know, and we just keep cutting. All right, she's doing lots of sword moves. She's swishing and swashing. The audience doesn't know what to do, you know. The audience doesn't question <laughs> it because it's so fast. It's just too much to take in. We don't want them to think. We just want to keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Of and then you know who turns up. Straight away in the next scene. Who? 
Who? Well, who other than Harrison Ford, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> so this woman is sword fine and, and cutting about, and then out of nowhere is Harrison Ford. Are we getting ghost Harrison Ford or real Harrison Ford? No, real Harrison Ford just rocks up. And, you know, he's a bit of Han Solo. He's a bit of Indiana Jones. He's a bit of all of his mm-hmm. classic other franchises. And then there's a knock on the door, and guess who else rocks up, Nathan? Oh, who? Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Oh, two iconic legends. Mate, and guess what he's wearing? He's in his Caddyshack outfit, and he's there ready to, ready to get some <laughs> shit done, Nathan. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And, and so for a brief moment, we're, we're, we, we see we you know we see Indy's hat, we see Han, Han's blaster, we see the mole rat thing from Caddyshack, and we're, we're taken back to a simpler time, but we can't think about it too much. It's just there for nostalgia, and you might shed a little tear, but the oh, next okay. moment, the two characters fucking die in the next scene, okay? They get... Oh, they're, no! They're, <laughs> They've killed beloved characters actors. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to make sense. They, it doesn't have to make sense how they die. They are just like, mm-hmm. like, like something just impales them from behind and we lose them in that moment and the main protagonist cries <laughs> about it and is so upset by these characters they've just met that we obviously have a connection to as an audience, but like it's sad and like shocking that they've gone. How could they possibly kill off these main, main characters from old franchises that we love from the past? But Nathan, they can and they will. And then we head to oh, the climax no. in the movie, Nathan. And guess what the climax of the movie is? What's the climax? There's this great classic film that I think that we should base all of our new cinema off, and it's called The Phantom Menace. And (laughs) (laughs) in the the climax of that film, there's three plots happening all at once. Three plots. Some might say that's a bit too much. I say it's a bit too little. <laughs> Stuart Little, who also rocks up in this final fight, because remember him? Whoa. <laughs> that nostalgic bait right there. And so we have we have these three uh, storylines that are concurrently going uh, concurrently going at the same time in the same universe, but it's all action. It's got to keep going. We've got to keep jump cutting. We've got to throw some, you know, some little juvenile humor in there, some little jokes. And at the oh, end, yeah? it all leads up to the final moment where for some reason, all of our main characters who haven't really been established, I haven't spoken about them, but they're there, you know, there's some supporting oh okay they're there don't don't worry they're just there for some poop and fart jokes it's all good uh at the (laughs) at the end of that it's like the final fight in the film and our protagonist she hulk hogan you know she takes out the antagonist (laughs) and everyone gives her a big round of applause and we leave the cinema but you don't leave the cinema yet because there's a there's a the credits are rolling and everyone you know what to do when the credits are rolling stay in your you stay stay in your fucking seat okay (laughs) (laughs) how many post credit scenes are we getting Brenton several Nathan oh no (laughs) some say three three is too many I say five is not enough and they don't even have to make much sense they're just little little ad libs that are just here and there it can be like them having fun dinners at a restaurant it can be you know our our main character Character being like revealing some something about her, her her childhood and that the facts that she was Ooh. actually raised by the mole rat from Caddyshack, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and in the last the last moment, what happens is is that Samuel L. Jackson rocks up out of nowhere. Oh no! And he's got it. He complete with his Pulp Fiction wig, you know, just because that's there for some nostalgia as well. And of uh, and and he says that he's putting a team together. And mm-hmm. we don't, we don't, we don't even know what ref- what comic book uh, film this is referencing. But he's just putting a team together, and we just, we just, we just kind of like fade to black, and we've just got so many questions now, such as, <laughs> what did I just watch? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> he's so meta. How twenty nineteen? And then you walk out of the cinema and you check your phone, and it's got a ninety two percent on Rotten Tomatoes, and that <laughs> is my film from twenty nineteen. <laughs> Oh, now the thing is, the oh, thing well is, done. the thing is about this as well. The thing is about this as well is that it's important to note that we want cinema goers to keep going to it, you know, because the first time they're just going to be of so course. excited, so adrenaline filled by what they've just seen, they're not going to question everything. Yes. And when the questions start to come after the second and third viewings, you know what we do? What do we do? We announce the sequel. Of course, where it will solve everything that the first movie didn't solve. Nathan, that's that's what I have to say about my. F- what do you think? What do you oh, think? Are you down? <laughs> Are you down? That is def. I'm so sold on this movie. I think that's definitely the most 2019 made movie that could ever be made. You know, it just encapsulates all the trends of the era. Thanks, oh, mate. Appreciate that's it. That's amazing. Do you have a title for your movie? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be added hastily in post-production at the most marketable title or for the The, the Rise of the Mole Rat. That's what we'll call it. Brenton, I'm so happy with that pitch. I feel like that's definitely going to be made at some point. If, if not, it may have already been made. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Nathan, pitch me a film. 
from 2019, please. All right. So, yours definitely focused on the craft of 2019 movies. I, Brenton, have gone in a different direction, and I focused oh. on the topics of 2019. You wow. Know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The zeitgeist, as it were, of 2019. You know, if 20, someone in 2040 was to be like, you know what, we're going to go back to the age of 2019 and make it really centric in 2019. Here's, here's what they're doing. Brenton, this is my premise for a movie made about 2019. Okay. Brenton. It's a heist movie. Of course. And it stars the fictional sister of Greta Thunberg. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yep. And her name is Berta. Berta, Thun- Berta Thunberg? Thunberg? Yeah. Yep. So in this movie, in this heist movie, Berta is studying abroad in Australia. And she's out in the country just, you know, learning about, you know, nature and shit. And as she's doing that, a huge bushfire is about to engulf her home. Oh, no. I know. And and this fire is ripped through the whole country town that she's been staying at. It's moving very slowly, but it's coming, and, and, and she's got nowhere to go, so <laughs> she's trapped. What will she do? So Berta asks Greta to send out a troop of elite volunteers to storm the bushfire to save her. In order for Greta to find the right troop of volunteers to be airdropped into Australia to rescue her sister, Greta's got to find the right volunteers. So what Greta does is that she puts a hit order out on both Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. Oh, gosh. So this is to find the right group of elite people that are, you know, strong enough to battle the bushfires. So as Greta Thunberg starts hearing from all these assassins who are about to take on this mission of assassinating these two world leaders, she gets some interest from them. And she finds the right people. But before she can send them cash through her smartphone, she ends up being censored by China. Oof. Woof. And China cuts off all of Greta Thunberg's communications. Greta cannot help her sister, Berta. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, wow, wow, wow. I know. So, in order to save herself, Berta uses her TikTok account to share a <laughs> message with the world. Okay. <laughs> and she tells this traumatizing story of how she was sexually assaulted before the fires. And she asks the Me Too community to rally together to raise the funds for a rescue squad. Okay, keep going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <I've-> <laughs> However, as she does this in a stunning plot twist, Brenton. Australia, the nation of Australia, has been bought out by the Disney Corporation. Oh dear, I knew it, Bob. I knew it, Bob. God damn it. And Disney are empathetic to Berta's pleas for help. So what Disney decides to do is that they say, hey, we're going to rescue you, Berta. So the way that Disney, owning Australia, decides to save Berta is that they film the bushfires around her home and then they remove the flames by CGI. Oh, make it, oh what a twist. <laughs> Brenton, <laughs> this doesn't help. <laughs> so we, the audience, think that all hope is lost and the fires are finally going to engr- engulf Berta Thunberg's home when suddenly, out of the flames, Brenton, emerge the Hong Kong protesters. Wow, wow. How topical. And using their passion for democracy, they put out the fires <laughs> and rescue Berta. And she thanks them and then turns to the camera saying that it was climate change that was the villain all along. <laughs> Nathan, I don't, I, I don't even know what to say to that. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I actually think that if that film had been made, it would be uh, in the, the front runner for Best Picture next year. Well, this year, I should say. <laughs> I think it would have won. <laughs> I should say. It, it would win Best Picture this year in a heartbeat. Goodness me. Nathan, the only reason it wouldn't is that it focused too much on Australia. That was the, That's the only reason why, why it wouldn't. It's true. Yeah. They don't do that well internationally. No, no, no. Who's directing this? Obviously, George Miller. Who could who would who would nail the apocalyptic fires that that storm Greta? But it's it's a movie that shifts through, shifts through genre. You know, you got the heist movie element of of you know Greta trying to put together the team, and then you've got this like political court drama of the Disney Corporation trying to buy an entire nation. Of course, and then of course, and then you just got like a mash 'em up, hack 'em up kind of violent movie of of Hong Kong protesters somehow <laughs> defeating a bushfire. Mash- In Brenton, this will be the most successful movie you ever made. Mash 'em up, hack. Them up. That sounds like the the funniest like genre, mate. You're gonna de- you're defining genres here. Like, I, I oh, sh- like this, this movie will be a new genre. This will take the world by storm, Nathan. This is called the zeitgeist genre, Brenton, and it is it's a work of art that just it's so topical, Brenton. You could not make it more topical if you tried. <laughs> I truly think that we should both sit down 
and actually have a have a session where we kind of share ideas because I think if we combined both of our pitches, oh my goodness, if it was my story combined with your style of filmmaking, I think we have the most perfect 2019 <laughs> movie that could ever be made. <laughs> I could not agree more. But listeners, I want to hear from you. What, what, what would your what would your elevator pitch for a 2019 movie be? You gotta let us know. You've you you've gotta let us know. You've gotta. If it, there's anything, obviously, there's many things that could be said about this year. Comment below. Tweet at us. Contact us. Let us know what a 2019 movie would be. Please, please do it. But Brenton, enough about our movies. I think I think we should now spend the episode looking at the actual movies <laughs> that came out this year and maybe give our two cents on what we thought about them. Oh, for sure. Two cents is exactly what I'm going to give. Excellent. Well, what we do is that we thought we might, we might go through the list of movies that came out this year chronologically. And just, you know... We, we, we don't get a chance to talk about movies that come out this year. We consistently yeah. look at classics. So we thought we might just say, hey, these are good. These are not so good. Give this a watch. Avoid this like the plague. All righty, Nathan. Let's just chew through some movies. We're going to chew through them. And I'm going to start off with a few that you've seen because I, I haven't seen a, a couple of these movies. So you, yeah. you, you're, yeah, definitely, you're definitely more versed in the cinema of 2019 than I was. So oh, I'm just more, I'm just less social, you know? I'm just Yeah, I'm yeah you are. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the cold comfort of an isolating cinema. Nathan, mate. Tell me what you thought of Glass, uh, M. Night Shyamalan's most Ugh. recent uh, uh, feature film. See, at the time, I talked about it actually on the podcast. Um, like I remember. At the start this year. I can't remember which episode. But, like, it, hindsight's a beautiful thing. It's just a nothing movie. Like, if if it's just... It's got nothing to say. You're saying it's a... This seems to... I'm, I think this is going to be the start of a pattern here. Oh, yeah. This is, this is the this is, this is is the third in a trilogy. It is the end of like a of a storyline that has gone through the decades. Yes. You know what I mean? And and this is the f- fitting, supposedly, conclusion. Is it fitting? No. And it also hacks together this... Oh, by the way, spoilers for every single movie we talk about today. Sorry. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're going to spoil yes. everything. If we say a movie title, assume we're going to spoil it. So <laughs> we've lifted our barrier sure. up today. We're going to give you exactly one second notice when we say the title of the movie. Movie. So get that pause button ready. So yeah, Glass is stupid. They they the worst thing about Glass as well is that it tries to explain a superhero movie to an extremely like superhero like movie literate audience. So don't see right. it. Waste of time. Moving on. Captain Marvel. Brenton, this movie is also not very good. Nathan, I, I have a little story to tell that I'm going to tell oh, our listeners tell on, the, on the podcast. <laughs> Uh, so the was other it about night, you and me maybe catching a train? It, it was indeed about that. Nathan yeah. and I happened, by circumstance, to be on a train. We're on this train, you know? It's about an hour and a half, let's say, that we're on this train. And I asked Nathan a very simple question. Yes. Can you, could you rank all of the MCU films? And he said yes. And he did it pretty quickly, mind you. Mm. And you know what? He started at the bottom when he went to the top. And listeners, do you know what was at the bottom of his list? We could probably guess because it's the film we're about it's to Captain talk about. Marvel. It was Captain Marvel. Why is it at the bottom, Nathan? And it has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with like the, all the bullshit that was going on in that marketing campaign. It's just so boring. Just nothing happens. The whole movie is based around an amnesia pot that no one cares about. And like, also Brie Larson gives a very like still performance. They give nothing to do for all the other supporting characters. I don't care about any of them. And this should have been the moment where I cared about Captain Marvel. And Endgame later on does make me care about Captain Marvel. But just narratively, it's just such a cookie cutter nothing film, which is disappointing from the MCU. So that don't is very see it. disappointing. Um and, oh. and I feel for you, Nathan. Sorry about that, mate. Sorry about that you had All to good. go through that. Fire Festival, good doco. Give it a watch. You watch an old man tell a story how he almost suck a dick. Four stars. No. Whoa. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's good. Let's talk about the Lego Movie 2. Yes. What do you think so, about Lego Movie 2? It's all right. So when Lego Movie came mm. out, Lego Movie came out, I absolutely love the Lego Movie. I thought mm. it was I thought it was really ingenious. I thought it was lots of fun. I thought it was a great screenplay. It was really heartfelt. I teared up a bit at the end. It was a good time all around. Uh, should have been nominated for Best Picture, uh, f- for Best Animated f- Film, uh, Feature Film. All that, that has just been said can also apply to when Brenton lost his fees. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, <laughs> as a follow-up, the Lego Movie 2 is trying to do some new things, which is, you know, admirable, but it just gets stuck in a rut, yeah. I feel like, the start. Yeah, an evil Chris Pratt. It's like, ugh. It just gets stuck in a rut. I feel like the, 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 the opening act of this film, I think, is the weakest section of it. I think once you get out mm. of the swamp that is the first act, we start getting, you know, back to what we want. But overall, I think it's a bit muddled. I, I appreciate they try to do something new and there's some there's some funny moments mm. and there's some good... Uh, I like... It is smart in a way how it's like sending messages about how siblings play together. I do like that and I was moved. I even cried in it. Yeah, when, yeah. Like I was... Stuff. Like, yeah, exactly. I was I was moved by that too. I thought it was really, really kind of ingenious, like mm. I said. But You and I both have sisters, so we both know what that's like. Exactly. It, it was... It hit close to home. But uh, overall, I just think it's a bit muddled. Uh, it's a bit of a muddled film and... And uh, 
it, it, it unfortunately the yeah. the great moments it has are uh, undermined by some uh, bit of sloppiness. Let's say sloppy. From the sloppy to the unsloppy, Brenton. What do you think of Shazam? I thought it was fun. I thought it was a fun time. It is fun, I, isn't I, I it? Thought it yeah, I thought this was probably, you know, that, that's how I describe this film is fun. F U N. Good times all around. Good performances. Oh. Uh, a bit of a when you really think about it, though, like as a as a film, it's a it's a bit of a nothing movie. Like in terms of what what really kind of happens in it, it's like an origin story. Uh, I'm excited to see where we go with Black Adam and The Rock and and all that stuff. You know, oh, that's gonna be great. And but also currently, as we speak, like Black Adam. Opens like two or three months before Shazam two. Yeah. So and and the next year we're gonna get a whole bloody Shazam party. I tell you exactly. what. Exactly. But uh, for what this is, it's it's okay. Uh, I feel a bit fatigued by the genre itself, and it was nice that this came out because it kind of brought us back to like the the, yeah. uh, the closest thing I can say is like the Sam Raimi Spider Man stuff. Like it's that kind of fun. Oh, it's as close as it comes. It probably is as as close as it comes. Yeah. It's it's, it's kind of that fun nonsensical superhero but still it's it's still a bit it's still pretty wholesome at the same time so i appreciate that mm, absolutely i definitely give shazam if obviously you've never seen a dc movie outside like maybe joker or like dark knight give this one a watch this is like what superhero movies should be you know yeah 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 speaking of superhero movies of what they should be avengers endgame britain what do you think of avengers endgame uh it was all right it was it was all right uh, How dare you? Uh, it was You've a, stolen our future, Brenton. It was, How dare you? It was all right. I think uh, in terms of the Avengers films, I think Infinity War is a much better film. But I agree. Uh, but for this, for what it was and for how many plot threads it had to resolve and all the shit it had to also introduce at the same time, it, it does an admirable job. Uh, the performances across the board are really, really, really strong. I like that we take some characters in some new directions. Very new. Yeah, and um, for me, the moment, though, of this movie is where it all kind of climaxes, and spoilers again, if you didn't already know, but it has a moment in this movie that's pretty remarkable and that I was literally sitting there and I kind of had like a little tear rolling down my face because I was like, man, little 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 boy Brenton would have never thought that we got here. You know what I mean? That like Was this- that when like Iron Man died or like No, it was when it was Avengers Assemble. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. It, when all they all came together and you were just like in the and the Avengers theme finally played and it was this big moment. And I, yeah, I was, I'm, and it was, the spectacle of it was pretty overwhelming. But at the same time, I was just sitting there thinking, "Wow, like this is, you know, this is what it was all leading to." And it's kind of like, "Wow, they they did it. They 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 <laughs> they, they managed to make." <laughs> and comic you did books. it with them, Brenton. They, you, they dragged you along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the comic they managed to make comic books work as like a, a genre, I guess. So yeah, good on them. And we've seen so many fuck ups in the genre as well. So you really got to like give Marvel its due, like that it just consistently works. You know, except for Captain Marvel. <laughs> I guess so, but for me, when I think about films that I've watched this year, this doesn't really cross my mind. That moment does, but apart from that, I I kind of forget about it. To be honest, I remember all the moments in it, but it <laughs> How doesn't. How dare stick you? With me. I think Endgame is an extraordinary movie, Brenton. And like, it's true, you need to see all the other ones to really like get the extraordinary feel of it. But it's so good. It's a, it had one job, which was to have a successful landing. And when you think of all the franchises that ended this year, Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Terminator, all that, like this is probably the one who landed its ending the best out of all of them. Yes. Like Yeah, I do I do like the last scene of this film. I think it's I think it's the perfect last scene. It's so poignant and it's it's great. And like Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Having Peggy Waltz with Captain America, I was crying. I cried so much in this movie. I haven't wept in a film like this, I think, ever. I think this is the most tearing I've ever done. And this poor teenage girl was sitting next to me. She was like 16 or something with her best friend. And she just saw me just like literally shake in my seat from all my crying. <laughs> I'm like, after the movie, I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's moving as hell, Brenton. And I just, oh, I don't know how the hell they're going to stop it, but hopefully they do. And even if they don't, that's fine. You know what I mean? Like That's okay. Detective Pikachu. A Detective Pikachu. Oh god. All right. Uh, so I love this movie. And shut up anyone who says it's not a good movie. It's a it's, great movie. It's not a good movie. <laughs> Brenton Shush. Okay. Why? I I am I am a Pokemon fanboy. If you, if you don't know, I love Pokemon. Yeah. I specifically I lo- Oh yeah, go back to our Pokemon episode listeners. Episode 51. Give it a watch. <laughs> You'll hear Brenton no doubt. So for the listeners in case you don't know already, I am a bit of a Pokemon fanboy, as they say. Uh, so I love the games. I I, I I used to collect the cards as a little kid with my sister. 
Um, and I and I loved watching the anime as a little kid as well. So coming into this and seeing in the trailers and the promotional material for it, I was down. I was down for the aesthetic of the film and the world they were kind of. It seemed they were building, and that's the biggest pro in the film is like how they capture the world of Pokemon uh, in a in a live action setting is just mwah, it's perfect. Like I love the, mwah, of the creatures. Kiss. And obviously, if you're a big fan, like half the movie is you just pointing out, going, "I know that Pokemon. I know that Pokemon." Yeah, the, and that, but for me, that was the most enjoyable part of the film, and that doesn't make a great oh, movie. No. So I was going, I was oh, like, no. I was like, oh cool, it's Psyduck doing Psyduck shit oh look at that it's it's fucking charizard oh it is a very much movie for the fans isn't it but but as a film with substance it's it hasn't really got any like to be, it's got a little bit i guess like in terms of its plot and it, it, it's going for that kind of friendship will prevail over anything family is important all that shit you know classic mm. pokemon themes uh but the story itself is a bit kiddy and I, and I and I mean that really I mean that a as Pokemon a, as a, movie is a kitty storyline. Hey, what I would say in this film is that it doesn't treat the audience with a lot of intelligence. In in and what I mean by that is is that like it treats it's it's a yeah, kitty film. That. There's 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 a difference between like a children's film and a kitty film. A kitty film is a film that is a f- film that the the distributors have gone. Let's make this for the kiddies, and so they've really dumbed it down. <laughs> and they've made and it's like please say that in the boardroom and not whereas like else. whereas like another film we're going to talk about on this list which I will not spoil, is a children's film. And it's got adult themes in it. And it's and it actually explores it, it uses the cinematic art form to like actually make some some um to make some art, I guess, for, for kids to enjoy that they can that they can think about yeah. and they can and they can consume and well they can consume and actually get something out of it as opposed to just consuming for the sake of fucking oh my God, look at that. It's a fucking diglet, you know? It's a, it's a Detective diglet. Pikachu lo- lost all credibility as an art film the minute they had Bill Nighy go on a rant about Pokemon merging with humans. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> Godzilla 2, Brenton, you didn't see this. Have you seen no. any of those movies? Godzilla or Kong or anything like that? Uh, no. No, I haven't. I haven't. Oh. I've, I've seen bits of them. I've seen like clips from them and they kind of make me laugh a bit. <laughs> Godzilla 2, Brenton, it's not a very good film, but it has probably some of the best film scenes I've seen in a movie this year. Good Goodness, goodness me. Are you, are you serious? Wow. Just go on YouTube and just look up the final battle where Godzilla's just like chopping up shop against all the other giant monsters, and it is beautiful. And for seeing that in a cinema, I was like gobsmacked. I'm like, this is it. Like five stars. But is the rest of the movie good? No, Brenton. <laughs> just just, just YouTube it, you know? Just, just look up some clips. <laughs> Ah, uh, Nathan, 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 you've got to tell me about X-Men and Dark Phoenix because I'm very intrigued about this uh, as to what the fuck happened. Like, like, to be honest with you, like the critics, like, like, bolt, like bolt, you know, they beat up this film, Brent, and they took its lunch money and left it for dead. And I can see why, you know, it does a lot of things wrong, like so many things wrong. In fact, you could just spend the rest of the year counting the things wrong it does. But you know what? It's not that bad. Like, it gets worse as the film progresses, but especially the opening 20, I was, like, full on board. I'm like, this is great. It starts off with them going to space, and there's a good heist mission, and all of the X-Men are like, you son of a bitch, we're in. And they try and, you know, save an astronaut. But at the end of the day, the movie just fucks up because it has the most pale acting from Jessica Chastain, who gives the most, like, nothing performance. And, like, all the alien antagonists, they're just... They just don't express. That's like their soul defying trait. And it just it's a beautiful representation for what this movie is, Brenton. Yeah. A paleless, nothing expression of a movie. Loved it for the F bomb drop by Psychops, but that's it. Is is the action at least good or Um, you do see James McAvoy try and walk up a set of stairs. <laughs> that definitely is probably the most tense scene of the movie. <laughs> Oh. It, uh, when I hear that, I instantly think of that scene in The Wolf of Wall Street when Leo tries to get in the car. That's it's literally that wow. it, they've almost like stitched like cgi leo onto like james mcavoy it's it's that carbon copy wow okay okay yeah that's that's dark phoenix but from the shit to the less ship rent and we've both seen toy story 4 hey okay so when i saw this i i sat there in the cinema uh and i watched toy story 4 and going into it, I was a bit worried. Oh, no. When this film was announced, I was very worried. But I had... Is it because I, of I your was... encounter with Woody this year? No. <laughs> well, that came afterwards, <laughs> and that has kind of ruined this film for me. No, uh, uh. All, jokes, all jokes aside. Uh, but should I tell that story? I don't know. Oh, someone might sue if you tell that story. Yeah, true, 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 true. If you want to know, well, email us, listeners. We'll tell you. We'll tell you about lo- Brenton being attacked by Woody at some point. Lo- long story short, Hong Kong Disneyland toys. Uh, Woody may have came up, come up and uh, solicited me, but that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. We, we, we learn to forgive and, and move on. Uh, but Toy Story Four, Brenton. <laughs> 
So I was sitting there in the cinema and this film ended. And I got to say, this was the first film of the year that I was like, well, that's the best thing I've seen all year so far. It's pretty good. And uh, I wasn't expecting to say that going in. I was I was looking for a point as to why this was made. Mm. And you know what? For me... Yeah, you brought your rotten fruit ready to throw at the screen. <laughs> for me, this... This is more enjoyable, and I would watch this again over Toy Story three for me. For me, in terms of like what I, w- I want to get out of a out of a film, like I- yeah, I'd probably agree with that. Also, it looks so much better, doesn't it? Oh my goodness, the effect, the the animation is just incredible. Jesus, I didn't know how like shit the previous ones looked compared to this one. I'm like, <laughs> man, they've upgraded it's really the graphics. Incredible. Like, but, oh. but um, I think this is a great character study. There's been a few good character studies this year. This mm. is one of them, of Woody. And I think, yeah. and, I, and I really enjoyed it. Not enough Buzz Lightyear is probably my only con, but that's just a personal thing. And, yeah, and it's, it's more, nothing it, to do. Same with Jesse as yeah, well, sadly. It's, it's more, that's more of a joke con, I guess, for me. But it's more like I was always the Buzz Lightyear kid. I was always like uh, to infinity and beyond. But uh, again, it's a character study. It's all about Woody. And uh, it's got a well, hell of an ending as well. God, that that hits you like oh, a ton great. of bricks. Yeah, jeez. I, w- I, d- I didn't think I'd cry in that film, but when Woody says goodbye, boy, I was tearing it's up. Great like, oh. It's a great scene. It's a great scene. Great scene. Great film. So good. Great film. Thanks, Pixar. You're back at it again. After Incredibles 2, I was a bit worried. This got me back on board, guys. Thank nah, you. They're great. I feel like on Onward, they're going to fuck it up again. But with Soul, I feel like that's going to be amazing. Time will tell, Nathan. Time will tell. That's Nathan's hot predictions for 2020. <laughs> Speaking of the continually good, Brenton, Spider-Man Far From Home. So let's take a moment to uh, talk about J.K. Simmons. <laughs> oh, my God. And oh, my God. Because I saw this movie back in July, and Brenton's like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go see it. And I knew J- and I, like, I knew J.K. was in it, and I'm like, Brenton, you have to fucking see this movie. And I didn't want to spoil that J.K. was in it. Brenton's like, oh, maybe. I guess I'm going to s- stop being outdoors. And then I'm like, Brenton, see this movie. You finally saw it like a week ago. Yeah, I, and I I'm waited like, a while. You waited a while. And I've been biting my tongue because of how fucking much we love the Raimi trilogy and you finally saw that they brought back J.K. Simmons hey, as I saw, and, and the, he's the only choice man he's the only guy that like oh, he, like there's no one I else I fucking squealed in the cinema anyone else was gonna <laughs> when pa- I saw him it's one of those parts that a lot of other a lot of other actors were just unfortunately gonna pale in comparison to what J.K. did in that original trilogy and it was yeah. nice to see him at it again and it was nice to see the character was updated as well for a uh, for a modern context it's great you know, he's not he's, the Daily Bugle he's so good the Daily Bugle isn't just like the newspaper it's it's this, uh, it's he's like an anchor basically, and it was kind of taking the idea off the the most recent Spider Man video game where uh, Jonah Jameson runs his podcast, his anti Spider Man podcast basically, and it was yeah. the same kind of idea. Which I would definitely listen. It was to. kind of this idea of like you know that's going all around of like fake news and that kind of idea, and like JK is just like living off that, and he's got his own show, and he's just like out there fucking spreading shit about Spider-Man and who knows what else. I hope I hope it's more fle- I hope his character is fleshed out a bit more in future films. Uh even, even mm. if it's not that's fine. Um but it was just I'm so happy if we just get a JK centric film for the third Spider-Man movie. That's all I want really. But getting back to actually the Spider-Man content, the movie. <laughs> mate, as a big fan of Mysterio from the comics, it was nice to see him get his due and Jake Gyllenhaal did a fantastic job. And the and the and the screenplay mm. did a great job of like uh bringing this character in in a way that worked. Uh, that still allowed Mysterio to be Mysterio. And I guess, like, it's credit as well, like, to continue from what happened at the end of Endgame and how that affects Spider-Man. It was nice to see that growth. For me, these new Spider-Man mm. movies, I'm just not as into, I would say, because... Uh, I agree. I still think the Remy ones are better. And I think it's also because they're so disposable, these that's new it. Spider-Man that's, films. Th- that's, ex- that's exactly the word to describe it, is that it's because they're disposable. And, and really, like, you're just waiting for Avengers to, to see Spidey in action alongside yeah. alongside his friends. And, he, and also, he's way too married to the MCU. Yeah, that's like, it. Spider-Man's like, oh, Iron Man's so cool. It's like, no. If you look at the past 50 years, Spider-Man has always always been cooler than Iron Man and Spider and like and like Tom Holland should have to suck RDJ's dick every time like he comes on screen it's like no it's like, to, like Tom Holland's cooler he, like, he shouldn't be like oh I just want to be in the Avengers no the Avengers should want to join Spidey he should be the cooler one in this equation the, well the statement I'm about to ba- about to make is a bit arguable I guess but like for me you know before the last decade Spider-Man was you know the the lead character of of Marvel Comics he yeah. was the, he still is by the way you look at the merchandise totally. it's like he he like trumps anyone else who comes close to him both DC and but, Marvel but you know nowadays like uh, the past decade it's been a lot of Iron Man focused you know content which is fine like that's mm. that's totally fine but for me again it's like I just want to see more Spider-Man in my Spider-Man 
<laughs> like you like you said. Exactly, yeah. And I want it to be very Spidey related. I felt they also made him way too close to Iron Man, especially with Homecoming, how he gets that AI in his suit. And I'm like, no, you're just making Iron Man 2.0. Sure, sure. And it's like, same thing with the Iron Spider. It's like, stop making Spider-Man Iron Man. I know that worked for you, Disney, but Spider-Man as himself is cool enough, you know? But uh, yeah, disposable. That's a good word to sum it up. Here's hoping they bring in Kate Craven for the next one or something like that. Just a real small scale good New York Spidey story. That's all I want. With actual stakes. Well, the thing for me is that I'm not sure if I really care enough to be worried about it. I'm just like, oh yeah, cool. <laughs> which is Well, they got J.K. Simmons, so we're going to be their opening day no which, matter what. Which is saying a lot for me, given, uh, as everyone knows, the Spidey fan I am. You know it's not disposable? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I disagree, actually, Brenton. What, you would call Once Upon a Time in Hollywood disposable? Yes, that's the exact adjective I would use. And I can see your blood boiling as I say this. Oh, Brenton. my blood's not boiling. I just, why, why would you say that? Because I just, the more I think about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the more I think about how it just, it's just nothing. It's just, I, I, I'm I sure you could, I'm sure obviously there's a billion film essays that can talk about the themes and the messages and all that kind of stuff of the movie. But the more I think about like a Tarantino movie and what I want to get out of it, it's like, I just remember walking out of it so disappointed. And especially the hype you and I gave it before it came out. I just, I just didn't love it. You know what I mean? And it's so long. Jesus, nothing happens for most of this movie. Uh, yeah, I guess from a plot standpoint, you could say that. But for me, I think... Um, I, I was so excited, like you said, going into this. And for me, this gave me something that I didn't think I needed out of it. And it was nice to see uh, Tarantino uh, mature as a, as a filmmaker and to see, see him do something that wasn't, you know, based around tricks and, and crazy uh, film editing techniques and, you know, zooms and pans and things like that. Yeah. It was nice to see him take a step back and do something like, which, you know, he has said is an ode to, to films of this era. But does that make a good movie? Yeah, it does. I think it does because... At the crux of it, again, is that the char- the characters of this like really drive it home, and it's nice to spend time with these characters. And it's one of those oh, it's one of those oh, movies- characters in the literal plural, like two of them. I think like only Leah and Brad get the get get anything to do. It's uh, that's that's arguable. Like again, obviously they're the two characters that this focuses on. They're the most fleshed out, but like the cast is, I think, exceptional. Like from from all accounts, mm. and 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 I like all the characters basically in this movie. But uh. What it's one of those movies. The more I think about it, the more I like it. Uh, I've I've since not I've, for me it's the opposite. The more I've, I think about, it, the more I dislike it. <laughs> well, and uh, hey, I've seen it. I've seen it for a second viewing as well, and it was even better the second time. And again, uh, you know, when we head to the climax of this film, um, which in case obviously we'll spoil that as well. You know, when it's like Leo uh, and Brad versus the 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 Manson murderers, it's it's um it it's just basically Tarant. It goes straight back to that kind of uh, pulpy Tarantino flick, you know what I mean? Which is just like ultra violent and mm. Tarant- Tarantino's take on on history. Yeah, I was really impressed with this. I think it's got a great screenplay. Uh, I think the performances are really exceptional. Uh, I think it's hilarious, and um, I really, really, really enjoyed it. It's one of the one of my top movies of the year. Nah, slow movie. The ending scene makes it up though. The, like the ending scene is worth it, but you could just go to YouTube for that. But then again, you also do need the context of the movie, so. No, we're, we're disagreeing strongly on this. Well, Nathan, tell me about Men in Black International. Jesus. If, if you want a how-to on how to, like, fuck up a franchise, look no further Jesus. than Men in Black International. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, wow, oh, it's just, it's just so bad. And I've seen Men in Black too, and, like, I didn't think they would make it any worse. It's the, like, it's the most nothing movie of this year, I think. And that's, and that is saying something as well. It's just... There, there's no artistic vision. This film has nothing to say. It's the most cookie cutter you can make a cookie. It's like it's like they made a cookie cutter out of cookie cutters. You know what I mean? Like sure. Jesus, they waste the whole cast. You can tell easily that F. Gary Gray like hated this process because like there's so many random tone decisions that don't flow together. Like oh, I mean the the bright spot is like the little alien psychic, but even then, it's just it's just nothing. It's just such a it's it's also it's so Sony. It's exactly what Sony would do with this property. Not to have a rant about Sony, because Sony do do good things now and then. But like, oh, it's the most like like safe, tested blockbuster. Let's make this for all the world's audiences kind of movie you can get. You know, Nathan, this sounds sickening. It doesn't sound good. It it sounds really <laughs> yeah. gross. It I felt really ill, gross. and there's vomit yeah. in this movie, and I'm like, oh wow, the characters really do understand me. Sounds gross. Sounds sounds gross. And speaking of a nothing movie as well, let's segue to Fast and Furious Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> Which, wow. it may not be Men in Black International, but also, again, a nothing movie. 
And that also wastes a perfectly good Vanessa Kirby. Again, like, I've never seen a Fast and Furious film. Does this live up to the franchise? Does it offer anything new? I mean, here's the thing. Fast and Furious should have never been a franchise. It is by sure <laughs> luck that these movies are still continuing. Like, I, like a million, like, stars had to align for this for us to be having the fucking ninth one come out this year. Like, how are we here with Fast and Furious 9? Hey, man, people must go and see it. I don't go see them. Like, I've, like I said, I've never oh. seen one. And I'm really interested to see what makes this franchise and what makes it interesting and why people are so attached. Obviously, maybe the characters are really interesting or something, but... Uh, it's Some of them's really good. I still argue five's the best. Like, and that alone is a good movie worth watching just as a standalone film because it also introduces The Rock into the franchise. But, like, outside that... I mean, everyone also writes about, like, Furious 7, like the seventh one. But honestly, if you're not... And obviously because Paul Walker died, but if you remove all that marketing hype away and all that sadness, like, there's not much of a movie underneath it. Like, ah, uh, just... Just let it go. Just let it go, Brenton. Just let, let the it past go. Die. Are, you talk- are you talking about Disney? Nathan, let's talk about the Aladdin remake. Woo. Oh, Jesus. We both saw that, didn't we, Brenton? What did you think of fucking Aladdin? So I hate I hate this stupid remake shit Disney's doing. They need to fucking stop it. Mm. They need to stop it. It's it's <laughs> and I get it's making money, Disney. I get that's why you're doing it, but please just Come up with something new. Good Lord. Anyway, oh, but despite that, you know what? Aladdin wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'll give it that. What? Oh, come on. Really? What was good about Aladdin? It's, 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 not, as, it's not as bad as what I thought it would be. That's like, that's like not a good comment to say about something. <laughs> that's the compliment you can give that's, Disney that's, these days, that's, isn't it? That's, that's, that's not a great compliment for a film. You no. know what? Will Smith is being Will Smith and he and he does what he can do with that character given that it's yeah. legacy and the best not. they can do without Robin Williams exactly like, exactly and he brings his own yeah. thing to it which is you know some of the shit that's added in it is really pointless and stupid just every addition I just like I hate the new sidekick for Jasmine yeah, I, 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 that was the thing I was like, referring to yeah no, no no Jesus I don't like Jasmine's new song right at the final battle it's like oh you know what like I I I I I I appreciate that they gave this actress uh what's her name I literally know as the as Jasmine from Aladdin I can't remember great and that's what the, yeah she's great she does other good but things I but like her, her work but that's what I mean I like her work and I like that they gave her they gave um some stuff to do I think that's great um but the song's bad <laughs> yes but it sticks out like a sore thumb from like the rest of Megan's music in this in this film and that's why I think it stands out it's not necessarily a bad song. It's just that uh, it doesn't really fit in the chronology of uh, the music in, in this uh, Also, how bad should Jafar? Yeah, look, he's not as uh, menacing <laughs> as he should be. I'll, get, I'll say that. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Even with Jafar, they fucked up. He's the easiest role to play. Even Iago, even the fucking bird, they managed to not do well. Nathan, would you say this is a nothing movie? Oh, definitely. This is the year of nothing movies, isn't it? Just, oh, just... I agree. Just, especially the year the franchise is just... Just buried. I you know, the I agree, Nathan, and I think it's uh, I think it's a sign that people need to start doing something about it because this has been happening the last yes. few years, and there's been more and more every year, more nothing, 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 nothing films coming out, and I'm getting over it. In spite of that statement, in spite of that statement, Brenton, we arrive at John Wick three, which is actually quite excellent. I'm so excited to see it. So tell me about it. This is so good, and despite everything we said, John Wick remains that golden goose that just that just bless Keanu Reeves and his little mittens because. It's so good. Honk. Sorry, that was the goose. Get away. Get away. Oh. Get away. Shoot. Go away, Shoot. Untitled Goose Game. And like, Keanu Reeves is so good. And, and and you know what? It's the best of the three. And that's saying wow. something because the second one's better than the first. Like, they all get better. And wow. this one's fucking incredible. How's the action? It's so good. Oh, it's so good. And they do so many new things. I think the best action scene I may have ever seen in my life is in this movie wow. so far. And like, and it's where Keanu and the, and the, and, and like some henchmen are in a knife shop. And like, and they just keep on like going to the walls to grab all these different knives and just throw them at each other. And it's extraordinary. Wow. I gotta watch and it. Honestly, if you wanna know if this is the franchise for you, just watch that scene and see, cause you don't need any context for it. Just see Keanu Reeves just chopping up shop and just see if you like it. And if you love it, oh, just watch it. And it's so good. It's amazing three of these exist and they're all excellent in their own way. Wow. Oh. I gotta watch it. I gotta watch it. Nathan, tell me about Downton Abbey, the movie. The Downton Abbey movie. All right, Brenton, I have something to confess. I've seen all episodes of Downton Abbey. That's not something to confess. That's something to. That's a statement to be say with pride, Nathan. Yeah, it's a but popular see, it's show. A show made for old people, designed by old people for old people. You know what I mean? It's nostalgic for a time that no one alive could really remember. Wow, you're really you're really letting the listeners in on your psyche right now, aren't you? Jeez, it's because I'm old. In Brent. one episode, you've admitted that you've got no social life and that you're an elderly <laughs> man. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jesus, what, what a revelation. But you know what I mean? Like, it's just... Anyway, so I love Downton Abbey, and, like, I love this show. It's a bloody good time. And I saw I saw this in gold class with all the other old fuckers. Uh, just we all sat around, and I, you know what? <laughs> I went. I went with my mate Trent, and we and we ordered oh. tea in the cinema as well because you got to have tea when. Are you downtown. are you serious? You ate you drank tea in gold class. Yes, I did because I got nothing else to do with my income. Ugh. You naughty naughty boy, Nathan. Is Lily James in this? Movie? She isn't. So so inside joke for oh. the listeners. Lily James is is who Brent and I both universally want to marry. She's just perfect, everyone. I think we can all agree. We can agree. And oh. she's obviously in a very happy relationship. But you know, until the day comes, if she's ever widowed, you, you, Brent. And you know what you and I are doing. <laughs> Welcome to classic movie bed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, geez. Nathan. Speaking of Lily James, did you see? Uh, oh, by the way, Brad, Downton's great. The movie's excellent. If you love oh. the show, you'll love the movie. And <laughs> do oh, wait. Do I need to? Do I need to watch the show to watch the film? Yes. And it's it's so fan okay. y You got it, and you got to watch the whole thing as well. Otherwise, you'll get none of it. Okay, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and he'll never see it. But the show's good too. If you want to see a good show, and you, if you're really ill, watch the whole series of Downton Abbey. But that's Downton Abbey, Brenton. To go from the great, we're going to go back into the shit and continue my rant from before. Zombie Land Two, Brenton. Oh no, it's bad. It's so fucking terrible. Like. Out of oh, everything, no. like so, so like Men in Black was the most nothing movie this year. I love the original Zombie Land, Brent, and you know, I I had my first born with the with the Zombie Land movie. <laughs> I wouldn't say I love it, but I really enjoy it, and I I, I like it's it. It's a damn I, good I, time, you know. You know, we had a summer of love together, the first Zombie Land and I. Oh, and how's this new one? Terrible. It's just. It's, it doesn't do that sequel thing where it tries to copy the same movie. It genuinely tries to do something different, but it's the most like. It's, it's like what a child would think a zombie land sequel would be about, which is ironic considering this is made for adults. But you know, it's like, let's let's <laughs> do a, it's a, it's the most lazy premise with the most lazy writing. It's like, it's probably the most lazy film of the year where they're like, let's make Woody Harrelson fall in love and maybe they all got to start a family, but then there's more zombies coming. It's just, oh, it's just an abysmal mess from start to finish. There's, there's a couple good jokes. The best thing about this movie is that they, there's like a new side character who's like a stereotypical dumb blonde who's genuinely funny and genuinely excellent. And she is going to have a great career ahead. But just... But overall, the humour doesn't hit them up. Oh, jeez. They waste Rosario Dawson. The, the, it does have an extremely excellent post credit scene that I don't want to spoil. But just type into YouTube, Zombieland 2 post credit scene, and just watch it in full... And it might be the best thing you've ever seen. But it's a post credit scene, Brenton, so I'm not including it with my rating on the movie. <laughs> okay, okay. Which is thumbs down, apparently. Oh, my thumbs are buried in the soil. Oh, I guess I'll just watch the first film again. Oh. Well, Nathan, guess what we're talking about now? Is it is it Todd Phillips' Joker? <laughs> yeah, you're oh, right. How, how did, did I you know? know? <laughs> it's always like we have a list in front of us, Brenton. <laughs> uh. Oh, Nathan, so I was excited about this film coming out. I was you interested were. to see what... Todd films. You would text me every morning with the countdown to this movie. I would, I would, I would. Uh, and I was excited to see uh, probably the best actor working in the industry today, Joaquin Phoenix, and what he'd do with this famous character. Yes. And then I saw the film. You saw it. And you know, it's pretty good. It it's is pretty good. pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's one of those movies, unlike Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that the more I think about it, the less I like it, but I still think it's good. I agree. You know what I mean? Like, I... I I, I kind of like how it captures this character. Mm. Phoenix is phenomenal. It's probably the performance of the year, aside from another performance that we'll talk about later. Oh, we'll get to that but it's, it's probably it's, <laughs> it's probably the performance of the year. It's such a... it's Again, going off Toy Story 4, it's another great character study that's come out this year. Good year I, for character studies, especially with the films we're about to be talking about as well. Definitely. I, I, like, I like that it's an ode to King of Comedy, uh, to Taxi Driver. But at the same time, whilst it's inspired by those films, uh, sometimes it takes a bit too much from them. You know mm. what I mean? Like there's a bit too much of the similar imagery, which is, you know, I'm, I'm all for inspiration, but it, it, it is a little bit derivative. Also, uh, but I like what Joker represents. I like that it represents that you can still do an art house indie style film and it can still make a billion dollars with the right amount of support. Totally. You know? Totally. And also doing interesting new things with IP. I think it represents both those two things, and I support movies that do that in the direction Hollywood should be taking, especially as streaming services take over audiences' attention. Nathan, you couldn't have said it. I couldn't have said it better myself. That was um, that was perfect. What I would, what I'd also say is though, even though I've said you know a, bit, a few of my kind of cri- criticisms that it's a bit derivative, uh, and I, whilst I appreciate some things, uh, I, I think it's a bit 
wanky in places. If that no, makes it's that definitely sense. wanky. Like it, yeah. It, also, it definitely it's a film that's also thinks it's smarter than it is. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps I'm I'm not sure about that yet. I th- I think I think that might be true. I agree. Mm-hmm. But overall, I think it's it's still one of the year's best films. And for me, in terms of my cinema experiences throughout the year, the the feelings I had watching this film um, when I haven't felt in a in a in a long time in the cinema. I'd say mm. I, I'd say I was uh, I was tense. I was uh, I was uh, I had I had adrenaline pumping through my veins. Ooh. You know what I mean? Like I was I was into it. Um, and I guess it's more in retrospect that I that I realized some of the criticisms. But walking out, I was like, yeah, I haven't felt like that way in a cinema in a while. Um, so thanks to Joker for that. Appreciate it. <laughs> but so it must be doing something right if I'm if I'm feeling that in in the cinema is my point. Yeah. So uh, good work, Todd Phillips. I, I think I think you're not a bad director, but I think uh, I can't wait till this film is cheapened by the inevitable sequel. I. I <laughs> I would have liked to have seen another draft of this film. Yeah, I would have liked to see another three drafts of this film, Branson. Perhaps. But that performance, man, that performance is fucking killer. He's definitely a front runner for the Oscar, but which we'll get to at some point. Perhaps. But from the studio, we go to the streaming, Brenton. El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie we both saw. What do you think about that one? It's good. It is good, isn't it? I think the biggest thing with El Camino is that I think people should look at it like another episode of Breaking Bad as opposed to a film. Ooh. Well, maybe not. I think you could still watch this without watching Breaking Bad and still get what? enjoment out of no, it. No, you could I still appreciate it. Yeah, you no, could. you couldn't. Yeah, you could. it's, it's, you it's, totally you could. Have, it's, it, you will not get the emotional payoffs you need if you don't have a whole show with Jesse. You, you hang on a second. You might not get the whole emotional payoffs of what you would had you watched Breaking Bad, but you're still going to get some emotional payoffs. I love the themes of this. You'll be like, who's who? Like, it doesn't explain anything. Like, even Vince Gilligan himself repeatedly in the marketing said, you have to watch Breaking Bad before this. But in my opinion, I still think that if you watch this without watching it, you wouldn't get the same experience as someone that had watched the show and knew all these characters inside and out. But you'd still have an experience that was well made, that was well crafted, had, had characters and interactions that were interesting. Mm. Uh, and, and watching it without all that, backstory i think is interesting enough in itself and there still is tension there and, and enough to care about in terms of jesse and to oh yeah it's still a great movie it's still excellent yeah i like i I, th- I think it's i think it's very well done um i like i said i love the themes of this i love what it's about about someone kind of finding their way and finding their place kind of in the world i love aaron paul as jesse pinkman i think that's just perfect uh chem- like perfect casting yeah i'm so glad he got the job again after breaking bad oh thank god he got rehired is this necessarily necessary yeah that's a good question because a lot of like the movie leading up to it was people justifying its existence it's like do we need another episode of breaking bad do we need an epilogue but like no not necessarily no. but i'm glad Same. we have it i'm glad I- it exists and i'm i'm glad to let I some agree. time pass and maybe rewatch breaking bad with el camino and saul as well do all of them back to back because I love Saul. I'm so excited next month for the new season. Saul, Saul is excellent. Oh, it is excellent. Mate, new season next month. Get around it. Whoa. <laughs> but yeah, but no, I think I think it's a wonderful addition to the universe and I'm, I'm glad Vince got to put a stamp on it and, and say this is how this universe goes. Yeah, it's a good movie. Great movie. Speaking of great movies, Brenton, we go to The Irishman. We were very hyped this year for The Irishman. I was, it, and it took me a while to watch it, to be honest. Yeah, Brenton had to figure out how to set up his internet and then work out which <laughs> cables to plug in, like, well, we'll find out what a Netflix was. I like for the dust to settle a bit before I sit down and watch something. I didn't want to be in the hype season to watch The Irishman. Well, and so I sat down and watched this movie. And I watched it in the morning because this is a morning movie. It goes for like three hours or whatever the hell it is. It's a long movie. But to its credit, it does not feel like a three-hour film. No, that was my biggest surprise too. It's really well-paced. It is, it is, it is. Yeah. And I'm going to say something that everyone might not agree with. Where be the first? I think this is one of Scorsese's best. I think this is uh, in his, in his. if you're going to list his top films, this would be in the conversation for sure. Yeah. I think, here's the thing, I feel like this is at like casino levels for me. It's like casino good course Scorsese. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's so, it's good. It's really, really good. And there's some excellent moments. I think it's one of his most mature films. But in saying that, I will be very curious to see how in 10 years people look back on Irishman. I don't think it will continue in the cultural conversation. I don't think people will look back on it as, as a landmark film of Scorsese's, the same that they do with like Goodfellas and Wall Street and all that kind of stuff. I think it could be. But again, yeah, well, I guess we'll find out. Stay tuned. But Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I genuinely think it could be. I, l- I love what this film's about. I love that it's, you know, we're going back to the gangster flick, uh, which, mm. which Scorsese does the best out of anyone. And you know what's great as well? Because there was a whole debacle about him versus Marvel and about like, you know, oh, fuck Marvel movies, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, we got to make art. I love that at the end of the day, like he did make the Irishman. And when you compare Irishman to Marvel, Scorsese is so on the money as far as like what direction films should be heading. Absolutely. In terms of like someone that understands cinema and and how to make movies, mate, Irishman stomps all over Endgame for oh. me. Like, it, it completely, yeah. like, and what it represents and all that kind of stuff. And even someone who was so fanboy for Avengers, I'm like, no, Irishman is what movies should be these days. Totally. But let's talk about the performances here. Like, oh. 
these guys, these guys, Joe Pesci, mate. Joe Pesci uh, just has nails often it. been. See, see, someone seen as someone that's typecast as like you know the angry little little reprising <laughs> his role from Home Alone in this movie. But what I love about him in this film is that he has such he has all of this he has all the power. You know what I mean? He has all that angry. He has all he's not giving it to the people. But he's uh <laughs> he still conveys it, but like through his stillness, through his eyes. You know his performance is so uh, contained, and I, I think it's just some of his best work mm. to be honest. Same actually, it's probably the best thing he's done since Goodfellas. For sure, for sure. Gotta love Al Pacino. Great. He's, He's fantastic yeah. in this as well as, as Jimmy Hoffa and Bobby De Niro, oh. arguably one of the best actors of all time. But what time. about Anna Paquin for all three minutes she's in? Hey, I think she's great. I think she's kind of the soul of the film. She is actually when you see like the relationship with the daughter. Great scene where Robert De Niro's like, you gotta forgive yep. me, daughter. And she's like, you're a murderer. And he's like, actually, that's a great point. And then that's the whole scene. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, this, this film's ending. Oh, yeah. Oof. Great ending. Really good job. Great ending. Oh, I'll tell you what. From things people rave about to another thing people rave about. Brendan, I saw Knives Out this year. Hey, I hear it's pretty good. Same! And I had so many people go, Knives Out, what, Ryan Johnson, what a foie, this movie, what a fun movie. I found it kind of fine. And you know what? The biggest crime I'm equipped this film committed is that it's a murder mystery film. So, you, it's you know, it's got to be full of twists and that kind of stuff. But really early on, I, I guessed immediately who the culprit was, how they did it, why they did it. Like, like, there wasn't that much revelation in this movie. It was Chris Evans, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Chris Evans. Of course, it was fucking. Chris was that Evans. right? Was that right? Yes. Oh you my nailed goodness! It. That's 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 from me watching the trailer. That's absolutely hilarious. Yeah. That I was like, it's Chris Evans. And the film makes like sure. a whole thing like, oh, it was actually Chris Evans, and you're like, no, just that, that is Holy fucking shit. proof. That is proof then that, and there that this movie that is, is so predictable. So funny. <laughs> Jesus, you heard it here, listeners. If Brendan can get that in a heartbeat, <sighs> oh. Fucking Jeez. hell. That's, that's the funniest shit I've heard. Oh, my goodness. Mate, you know how I put two and two together? I was like, Chris Evans, after Endgame, what's he want to do? He wants to do something where he's the villain, maybe, where he's not Cap America. That's one reason. The second reason is that all that marketing campaign, I was like, that's, that's the shiftiest motherfucker out of everyone that's been introduced in this, in this trailer so far. That is hilarious, man. And that is is what's wrong with this Extremely movie. Like, you wrong. just said it yourself. The fact that I just picked that is like a uh, fucking joke. Also, it's so weird. It's like, oh it's like I feel like Ryan Johnson was trying to say something about immigration with this movie with like the assistants. Oh, really? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, because wow, they're in okay, like, this like cool. old timey house and they have like a L- Latina, you know, house assistant and maybe she's the main suspect, but then she's like, ah, oh, I'm inheriting money. I don't know. And it's just... Uh, and also, it wastes the whole cast. Like, they give Jamie Lee Curtis nothing to do. They give, like, Christopher Plummer nothing to do. It's just... They do their best in the situation. I do like um, General Zod in this. I'm forgetting his name. Oh, Michael Shannon. Thank you. Yeah, he's got some great stuff to do. But at the end of the day, it's just... Oh. And Daniel Craig doing a Texan accent is the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. Hey, man. I don't know how I feel about Ryan Johnson. You know what I mean? I, I think... I, I kind of want to watch this to, to, to see it. Like, I feel have like... Have you seen it, his other work? Have you seen Knives Out? I'm sorry, I'm um, bloody... Have you seen Looper? Yeah, I have. Uh, I I think <laughs> Looper's... Looper's... Looper's a hot mess, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I enjoyed Looper watching it, but, like, then you think about it. It's, 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 it's a 2019 film. It's one of those ones you watch and you're like, oh, cool, that was cool. And then you're like, hang on a Wait second. a minute, this is actually not that good. <laughs> wait, wait a hot second here. Uh, so yeah, I've got no real inkling to watch that again. But he's working uh, television on Breaking Bad, and yeah, you know, he's great on TV. He's, yeah, is 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 wonderful. But except for that fly episode, Jesus, that's what the worst thing about Breaking Bad. Are you kidding me? Are you one of those people that like the fly episode? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, oh, I think get out! When I when I first watched it, I was like, was it, well, I would have <sighs> been sixteen or something. So I was it's like, the most soliloquy Ugh, based episode. Nothing, nothing's happening. Ugh. And then I watched the series. I've watched that series multiple times. As oh, you know. same. And every and time I get to the fly episode, it fucking like halts and then withers over and dies. <laughs> It's fantastic. It, it's I just think them it's going, oh, the flies are metaphor and it's all allegorical and all our lives are not changing. It's like, yeah, I get the message. And I still think it's a poorly executed message. Oh, wow. I think it's a well executed. Brendan, I'm throwing rocks and I'm throwing them all directions. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Oh, goodness. <laughs> which which takes us to The Lighthouse, Brenton, which you and I both saw last night, but separately. We did. We did. We did. You you kick us off, buddy. Well, it's funny. We haven't talked to each other about Lighthouse before. So uh, what do I think of The Lighthouse? It's a very... It's a very deep movie. I think there's a lot of themes. There's a lot to be read into The Lighthouse. I think it's a film that does say quite a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of meaning, you know? It is a film, Brenton. I think it's probably the most filmy film I've seen this year. You know? It's very artistic. It's well shot. It's well directed. It looks gorgeous. Oh, gosh. 
It looks this so beautiful. This movie's beautiful. This oh. movie's beautiful. Mate, I tell you what, I'd, I'd smack that on the lips. <laughs> Stunning. Why aren't we talking about this film more? Why isn't it in the awards conversation? That's so true. This feels like the Dark Horse movie of the year. You know what I mean? The one that last minute is just going to snatch up all the awards. Because I think Robert Patterson and Willem Dafoe, both of, the, both of them, give the performances of their lives. I agree. I think Dafoe, I'm a big fan. You know I'm a big fan. We all know you're a big fan. We know we're both big fans of Dafoe. I think he's one of the best actors working. Soul says I. We're going to put up the light hills. It's like, he's... Is that Welsh? I have no idea what accent he was doing that movie. This was a this was a tough film. You know what I mean? This yeah. this this had well a lot paced. of writing on those performances. Yeah, well paced, great fucking screenplay. Yeah, like we said, beautifully well shot. And you know what? This is a great screenplay that it could be a two hander play, but it works better yeah. as a film. I was thinking that the whole time. I thought this would be a better play than a movie. No, I think it's a better movie than a play. Whoa. But I think it could be a play. But when I th- but when I thought about it being a play, I was like, no, because. Because the camera, like, and and the director is like a character in itself. You need you need that visual imagery in it to like to make it work. Mm. And I just think I I I just think it's great. I think it's really, really it is really good. excellent. And it's worth seeing. I think it's also probably the most rewatchable film I've seen this year. Like this is one I really wow. want to see a yeah. couple times just to because I because the because just seeing it I was like I was tr- kind of getting what it was about. But also because it's so littered with unreliable narration the whole way through. You're like, is this happening? Is this surreal? Is this an actual thing? And so I really wanted to sit down and just like just chew through it and really try and understand what's going on. It feels like The Shining and the. And Bioshock Infinite had a love child, and that's what this movie is. Wow, that's 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 a that's a way to sum it up. I think it's like a Sam Shepard play, is how yeah, it, it, I, that's it's a good like point. Sam, it, it's like Sam Shepard meets uh, Bioshock Infinite, like you said. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what it is, and like, and I love it. It's so good, Brenton. There's a great mermaid. It's in very it. good. I love the tentacle stuff. You see a bird getting beat to death. What a scene. Holy shit, dude. That was that a was good fu- scene. And it goes for like a that minute. Was, <laughs> that was fucked up. That was, was so like, oh, fucked up. I love the birds in this movie. They're just like, they're all fucking like, are you fucking with us, Robert Pattinson? He's like, fuck off. Hey, hey, man. Robert Pattinson. Oh, how good is his Brooklyn accent? Like, oh. Great. I think he's I think he's outstanding in this film. I think he was really good in The King as well, which which oh wait, we didn't talk about that. Oh yeah, the how's King the King Brenton? Netflix. Oh, it's enjoyable. I, I think it's I think it's quite good. I think it's a it's a good kind of period uh historical uh film that's also quite quiet. Again, it's a character study. <laughs> on, Who would have uh, thought in twenty nineteen? Oh. And and Timothy Chalamet's great. He's great. Mm. Um so it's it's worth a watch if you're into like again, like period historical dramas. Uh it's it's a solid one of those. And Robert Pattinson Fuck man, he's great in that as well. Oh. He's got a smaller role, but he's he's really good. Um, I'm glad to see that he's having a resurgence. That he, I know. And you know what? Seeing these films that he's been seeing, um, Lighthouse this year makes me think he's going to be an excellent Batman. Like they picked the best person. Absolutely. For this. Oh, but you know what? It's whether or not the film itself is going to be good when it comes to Batman. Like it's like Ben Affleck. Exactly. You know? Yeah. It you watch Batman on the versus writing. Superman. You're like that guy could that guy could work as Batman, but you know. It's just not working because <laughs> Batman versus Superman. Yeah. Holy fucking shit. Brenton, speaking of oh, holy fucking shit, we arrive at Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. <sighs> <sighs> Do it! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw this opening night. I think you saw this like a couple of days after, Brenton. Yeah, I saw it opening weekend. Yeah, you saw it opening weekend. Guess what? The cinema had probably eight people in it. Wow. That's that, Especially in Sydney as well. That's saying something. Like, Yeah, it's fucked. Wow. Brandon, what do you think of Star Wars Episode Nine? Okay, so this is the movie of the year that I, when I, the more I think about it, the more I fucking hate it. So. <laughs> I agree, actually, and I'm so upset that I'm saying this about the Rise of Skywalker because I don't want to be like that with it. Because at the end of the day, this is this is the culmination of this third trilogy of Star yeah. Wars films. Of this, people have been the- saying the nine films, but honestly, if you do look at the Disney trilogy, it's not. It, it, the one job I had was to wrap up the sequel trilogy. Yes, maybe the nine films, but more the sequel. And you know what? For some of the interesting ideas ideas that the last jedi had this obviously retcons them all but not only that this film makes that trilogy nothing exactly this was the film that finally had to deliver a thesis statement on on the star wars sequel trilogy say this is what it's about here's the message this is what we want to say about this universe and it just if it stumbled 
on the court, dropped the ball, and accidentally landed its head in like a fence spike. Yeah, look, it's not great. It's it's really it's a bit of a fucking mess, to be honest. It really it's, is. It's, it's, and like, there's a billion YouTubers you could go to that that go into detail on this, and like, you could get there's going to be a billion video essays going about what went wrong with this movie. So like, yeah. But but for me, especially as someone who loved Force Awakens and Last Jedi, especially Last Jedi, who was so fucking excited about the narrative decisions it took and the interesting directions it went. This made me. S- I can't believe Disney listened to the trolls and completely undone all the things that Last Jedi did. It's like, and not just the trolls. Obviously, there are normal people that dislike Last Jedi as well. But like, it baffles me how unconfident Disney was in their own movie, and they just thought, "Fuck it, let's make the most safe film," and end up just squeezing ourselves to death. What's interesting is that it's obvious that they thought it wasn't safe. That they thought they were making a lot of big fucking decisions. But at the oh. end of the day. These decisions that are made about characters, about the universe itself, about uh, the the lore of Star Wars, even of the Force and, and, and all this stuff, none of it is grounded and none of it is serving the actual story. Mm. So what you're left with is fucking Emperor Palpatine going, ha! And then, like, lightning fucking bursts out of his hands and goes into space and electrifies all the ships in space and literally... People laughing in the cinema. Oh. There was two films this year I saw that people were laughing at in moments. Laughing at the films, not with the movie, at the movie. And this was one of them. Breton, should we talk about the other one then? Yeah, I, I got nothing else to say. I got nothing else to say to, to Breton. Just- this whole podcast, Breton, we've been leading up to this moment where finally we have a new movie and it's cats. Guys, Nathan hasn't seen this. I Yes, and I'm so sorry. Actually, you know what? I'm not sorry. I'm not going to apologize for not seeing cats. Because this whole this whole fucking podcast, Brenton made me sit through the stage show, which I hated. And it and it stands as, as one of our most hated movies. And this whole podcast has been like, oh no, Brenton, what about Tom Hooper? And I'm like, no, it's going to be as bad, if not worse. And then the movie came out, and to the surprise of no one, this movie is horrendous. And yet Brenton persisted, and you still saw this. Hang on a second. At the start of this year, when you were reading all the all the film articles, all the film magazines, and they were talking about like you know, uh, fucking award season predictions, like Cats was there. It was like, oh yeah, and Tom Hooper's Cats. Then the trailer released, and everyone was like, holy. Everyone fuck. like <laughs> undoes every article they've ever written on it. Then it came out, okay, and I went and saw it on Boxing Day. You did to a cinema that had that was that was full. Basically. Which baffles me, considering how much money this film's going to lose, but continue. Nathan. <laughs> how is Cats, Brent? Because we haven't talked about this, and I'm f- I've been waiting so long. What is Tom Hooper's Cats like? This is the worst film I've ever seen in a cinema, for sure. <laughs> wow. For sure. And, and it might be the worst film I've ever seen, like, I've, I've, I've seen in my life. Wow. To be honest. That is, that is, uh, and that's saying something, because I've seen some bad movies, but this is a stinker, and... It's also a spectacular disaster at the same time that is worth watching just to just to see because I was glad I went because I felt like I was watching a piece of cinematic history. Oh my goodness. It makes it takes that terrible musical which I've said is the worst musical ever written. I stand by that. That's 38 years old or whatever it is mm. and it makes it worse. So how is it worse than the movie that you and I reviewed for the podcast? All right, well, I'll, I guess I'll go through our review standpoint. So you, let's talk about it technically. Okay. Okay? The sound's shit. The sound, the <laughs> film isn't done. Let's let's start off with that statement. Like, the film hasn't been completed. There is clipping effects on, like, the CGI, like, really? all the way through the movie. All the, all the cats are, like, levitating, like, about two inches off the ground because, like, they've clearly just, like, put these, like, CGI bodies on them and, like, the effect hasn't been, like, completed or, like, what? edited. Like, in frames. The frames are not done. There's an opening shot of Monkstrap, who's, like, the leader cat of the cats. Not old Deuteronomy, but, like, the black and white cat. Yeah. He, like, leans towards the camera, right, and is looking at another cat. And his face is, like, off his body. Like, his human face is, like, off his what? fucking body. Jesus! <laughs> like, there's shit like that. There's also, like, there'll be fur in some places on some anim- on, on some of the cats. And then, like, the next shot, like, in terms of continuity, that fur on their face is, like, gone because, like, they forgot to, like, put it in, like, for that other shot. Okay. There's a scene where, like, Judy Dench's, like, human hands with, like, her, like, wed- wedding rings, like, are showing, like, just, like, in the film. Like, it's, it's fucking not done. Okay, like, like, as in, like, not the character's wedding rings, like Judy Dench's wedding ring. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't, like, ah, that's amazing. Ah. Te- also, technically, is the sound is horrible. 
Like the sound. So the actual quality of the sound is horrible. Yeah, it's not good. Like it's, I it was the worst sounding film I saw all year in the cinema. I was like, oh my goodness, this oh. is like not balanced properly. It's not mixed properly. I was like, Jesus, what's going but on? But a lot of the saving grace people who champion the Cats franchise is the songs. So how are the songs, Brenton? Well, they kill the songs. The, the songs are destroyed because they keep adding shit to everything. They this is the thing. They're like, we got to add more to keep it like. You know, like, uh, Tom Hooper's like, I'm an artist. Because like, I wasn't that impressed more. by the songs as well. So, like, what did they add? So, we 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 open with Jenny. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. I can't believe... I'm, I'm going to spoil Cats, by the oh, way. Oh, you can spoil Cats. Cat, is it even possible to spoil Cats? Like, you can't spoil Cats. No, there's no plot anyway, yeah. so whatever. So, so we add this new character called Victoria, who is the white cat in the musical, who's, like, the ballet dancer that doesn't really do anything. But they make her a character, and she's, like, the new stray that's been introduced to the Jellicle tribe. And then we go, the first cat we really meet is Jenny Anydots, who's played by Rebel Wilson. Cats, I think, should and will kill Rebel Wilson's career. I don't think she can come back from this. I haven't seen Jojo Rabbit yet. I know she's in that, but like, I, she is fucking awful in this what movie. Does she she's do? not funny at all. She's doing this slapstick. She, she, she like falls all the time. That's her thing. She's a fat cat that falls over itself. Okay, so so her number is the Jenny Any Dots number, which is like I have a gubby cat in mind. And in that song, they say that she like teaches the the mice like uh, things and whatnot in the song. Mm. Uh, and in the stage show, it goes into a tap number. They fuck up the music. So the music's fucked because, like, they're not, like, keeping a consistent beat. Tom Hooper keeps slowing it down like he wouldn't, like, Les Mis, which kind of works, I guess, in Les Mis, like, in, in, when you think about it, that it's, like, it's spoken dialogue, so the actors might want to slow it down or whatever the fuck they did. Like, no, just keep Les Mis flowing, please. Like, that's fine. But in Cats, just... It's a fucking song. Just get through the song. Like, we don't need to slow down and learn about the mice. So, anyway, every time Rebel Wilson begins, like, a new interlude in her song, she goes... She just slows down, and the music stops, and we have to fucking, like, bring up the tempo again. And then she reveals that the cats are not the only CGI'd humanoid animals in the film. What? Nathan, she reveals the mice that she's been teaching. No way! (laughs) What? (laughs) Who look even worse, and they're like little, they're small. They had humans play the mice as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the mice are there, like, doing their thing as well. But Nathan, they're not the only other animals that are in this film. No. Then the then the army of tap da- dancing humanoid cockroaches come out. No! <laughs> no, you're fucking with me. There are tap dancing cockroaches in this film. I'm not, what? I'm, I'm not. <laughs> there's like, there's 200 what? of them. And, and, you and, then Rebel Wilson, and then Rebel Wilson will occasionally come out and like eat them. Like fucking grab the humans and like fucking. As in like, them out and, and you can see on their human faces that they're being eaten. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes. What is this movie? Nathan, it's so bad. It's so bad. Um, and, and it's just, it's horrible. And at that point, that was the point that I was like, I don't know if I can sit through this. Like, I thought this was going to be funny. <laughs> this is fucking Jesus. <laughs> then, then Jenny Any Dots doesn't just fuck off and go away because we're introduced to McCavity, who's, who's part in the movie, Idris Elba plays McCavity, by the way, is fleshed out for some reason. Okay. And McCavity can su- suddenly teleport cats like he can apparate, like in Harry Potter. What? Yeah, he can apparate. And so he starts apparating all the cats that sing their songs to, like, a boat in the River Thames. Like, so, like, and he's, like, I'm, his plan is to, like, get rid of all these cats and make them walk the plank into the water. Okay. So that they can kill all the cats, and then he'll be the only cat left to ascend to the heavy side layer. So old Deuteronomy has to pick him by virtue of that he's the only cat left. So that shit's going on at the same time, and there's no real music. They add they add a couple of songs that are fucking terrible, and then we go to James Cornyn. Oh my god, who's the who's the, who's the Buster for Jones, the big fat cat, and it's it's fucking terrible. Does he just James Gordon it? Is he just James Gordon? And then some. Oh he no! Starts, like there's a bit there's a bit in it that like like the person one of the people I was seeing this film with said to me. Isn't that character in the musical, like, the point is that they're meant to be, the cat's meant to be, like, big, but he's very, like, dignified. He's, like, baron-esque. Mm. And I was like, hang on, hang on, this person I was talking to. No one had any dignity left. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was, like, <laughs> like, Jeez. like, honestly, like, there were fucking tipping bins over and shit, and there's, like, all this, like, huge, like, 
like the scale of like the world doesn't make sense as well. Like some things are like cat scale, but then some things aren't. It's really fucked up. And so he's eating this like giant lobster and he's like trying to sing at the same time. And you're like, oh my goodness, this is like horrible. This sounds so boring. <laughs> Jason Derulo doesn't even go, hey, I'm Jason Derulo. Oh, missed opportunity. One star. And he's, and he's fucking terrible as well. Like everyone's terrible. When Judy Dench came on screen. Everyone in the cinema laughed. It was the funniest <laughs> shit I've ever seen in my life. Closely, then followed by something that was the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen in my life, which was Judy Dench curled up on like a cat bed, seeing Ian McKellen, and then stretching her legs sexually above her head and going meow, like Jesus. turning her on. What is going on? Who 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 convinced these actors to do this shit? Oh. When when we were introduced to Rebel Wilson, I forgot to say this by the way. She's literally starts licking a crutch or trying to lick a crutch, and she's like in these like weird like split like positions, like showing us her like genitals. Like it's fucking weird. Like it's it's Jesus. it's fucking disgusting. And it upsets me more that this now exists. So somewhere, someone in the world jacks off to this. You know, like someone really loves this. Mate, the furries are going to be having a field day. But even so, they're not going to be because the whole idea of furries is that they still look like animals, yeah, I guess. Yeah, they believe they're animals. This one's just some awkward ass hybrid. They, these look like, you know, Satan's helper, helpers, oh. you know, in fucking in hell, <laughs> like helping them out. And and I, I'm going to keep going because there's more shit in this movie that like I just I just need to tell you. Oh, my God. This, so um, Ian McKellen's the best actor in the film. Okay. But at the same time, he has some fucking funny moments where he starts like, because he's like, he's like, he's like method acting as a cat. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so he starts like licking himself at various points and start making like cat sounds and shit and rubbing himself up against things. And he comes <laughs> out and does his songs. This sounds so stupid. And then we do Skimble Shanks, the railway cat, which is the best number in the in in the film. By the way, of that they actually finally some do something with the songs and the cats all start to dance on the railway tracks. And you're like, well, at least you know, at least it's something. And then we go back to. And then, and then in that song, they show the mice again, and I was immediately gone. I started laughing oh again. It was so fucking stupid. Anyway, so this whole McCavity thing is, like, built up throughout the movie, and then Taylor Swift comes down and does, like, one of the worst songs in the film, which is the McCavity song, and she has this or- horrible English accent. Oh, by the way, Jennifer Hudson's in this movie as well. Oh, right. How was memory? Oh, terrible. Like, oh, really? Everyone's like, oh, that's the showstopper. Like, that's the saving grace. And it's like, it's not. She's she's going for, like, the lame is, like, the Anne Hathaway oh, supporting yeah. actress Oscar. And so she's, like, trying to sing it, but is, like, fucking, like, crying the whole time. Ah. But it's, like, this weird CGI cat thing. And any moment that you might even feel for her, it then cuts to, like, Judy Dench's, like, horrible cat face, which is <laughs> really the funniest fucking expression i've ever seen i'm skipping over a lot but that's okay so then so then they decide that she's the one that's going to go to the oh my god McCa- the the fucking mistopheles the magic cat is is like the most annoying cat in the movie and his song is like totally nothing and he like accidentally starts casting like real magic and it's really confusing it's really fucking confusing it adds all these questions to cats like that they're like actual like possess like magical powers or something okay shit. just like so then yeah so then old Deuteronomy goes oh hey Jennifer Hudson, we don't like you, so we'll send you up to the heavy side lair. And they put her in this chandelier that's like been crashed the whole time, and it starts to like raise again and light up. And you're like, oh yeah, okay, cool. How are they gonna do this? And then the chandelier like goes out of like this hole in the ceiling, and you're like, what the fuck's going on? And it reveals that the chandelier is attached to this like cat hot air balloon that's going to the heavy side lair. Like, I'm not shitting you. Oh like, my god. Like, <laughs> there's a cat hot air balloon <laughs> that's going. <laughs> Jesus. Jennifer Hudson. Is it like the Team Rocket hot air balloon, which is a cat face and then some string? Exactly. It's it's basically that. It's oh like going up. It's got the string down the bottom, like going up. And you're just like, what the fuck? And then like McCavity, who's Idris Elba, like tries to jump on the string of it. And he's like, and then he falls off and he falls on the top of this building. And it's presumed that he'll like be like fucking dead up there because he's stuck on the top of this like skyscraper. Anyway, so then we go into the last song, which is the addressing of the cats, which I don't know if you remember from the from the musical. Ugh. There's the one where Old Deuteronomy like tells you how to address a cat. And there's a point in the song. The start of this song started with Judy Dench because Judy Dench has to sing it. And it breaks all conventions of cinema for a moment. And sometimes cinema does this. Like, there's a moment in 12 Years a Slave where it does this, where Chiwetel Ejiofor looks directly down the lens Oh yeah. in just one moment, and it's really powerful, and you're like, holy fuck, that was really moving. Judy Dench does this whole song to the camera. Like, it's a close-up on her Jeez. face. And she sings to you, the audience in the cinema. And as soon as she, like, turned her eyes towards the camera, I literally started crying with laughter. Like, it was the funniest thing <laughs> ever seen. There's a point in this song where the lyrics... The lyric in the song is, like, uh, that the cat wants some caviar or some other cat food, and it starts listing some cat foods. And 
J- Judy Dench's performance, she just lost all credibility because she started like trying to lick her lips at the same time as trying to sing like a cat. So she was like, like caviar. <laughs> Instead of like fucking licking her lips off. <laughs> Jeez. Uh. And her tongue's like fucking going everywhere. Anyway, so the last shot of the film is the fucking hot air balloon like ev- <laughs> apparating <laughs> in the, in like in like the sun. The, it faded to black, and the whole cinema burst into like fits of like uncontrollable laughter. Oh my god! Like it was the it was the it was one of the most weird, interesting experiences in a cinema I've ever had. And I really, in the end, I actually had a good time. But the first when it was like ten minutes in the movie, for about fifteen minutes, I thought, I think I'm gonna have to leave. This is a fucking atrocity. It's the worst film of the last decade, for sure. Oh my goodness! Like it's like movie, movie. What is it? Movie forty three. Yeah, movie forty three. But like, there's also Battlefield but, Earth. But I think. But I think that was the previous decade. I think this is what this is worse than both those for sure. Wow, Brenton. But Nathan, you're gonna watch. I'm it. I'm not going to watch point. it, <laughs> especially after it all of point. that. Jeez. We're gonna have we're gonna have some drinks at some point this year, and we're gonna sit down. I'm gonna watch it. I'm I'm upset that you gave your money to Tom Hooper and that you know he, you contributed to the very little box office that this film will get. But no, I I have no intention of 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 giving any money to the cats to Universal or just oh why? And you know what? Hopefully this kills it. Hopefully this movie kills cats. Like they'll stop doing it. It'll go away. And the world will remember the time that we had cats. You know, someone said to me, though, films like this is what's going to destroy cinema. And I agree. <laughs> it's like shit like that. that like people think there was people in my cinema that went to see it. There was a, like, obviously, there was a few people that went there like me to like see this thing. Yeah. And see what it was. But there was there was families there. There was kids like it was a Boxing Day film, right? Yeah. There was families there with young kids oh, who were having none of it. They were like, what the fuck have you taken me to? Like, they're saying this. Like, <laughs> the film's going, there's like little toddlers like, why are we here? Why are we watching? this weird like zany like thing from hell <laughs> that would have cost those families like over a hundred dollars to go see this this movie that they've spent their hard-earned money to go see a film that is not finished and they're expected to sit there and get some enjoyment out of it man people no wonder people aren't going to the cinema cinema anymore uh. thanks tom hooper thanks motherfucker i went home after this and i literally had to do some soul searching i had to sit wow. down i was like <laughs> i was like what 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 happened what what was what how did this what what is <laughs> oh, you can't see it audience but brenton's just got his hands buried in, his head buried in his hands and he's just lost all sense of plot all right well brenton that was the year 2019 and so let's have a break from 2019 for a moment let's have a breather after after your traumatic experience with cats let's take this opportunity to start a new tradition and what i want us to do brenton is I want us to look back on just the movies we've watched in the podcast. And as a little thing we could do, maybe once a year, I want us just to list for the listeners who haven't been bothered to listen to all of episodes and list the top five and worst five movies that you and I have reviewed so far. Over the whole podcast? Over the whole podcast. So just movies that you and I have reviewed. Obviously, this episode doesn't count. But just like movies we've done an episode on, I want us to list the best five that we've done and the worst five and just give our own personal opinions. So I'll start us off, Brenton. So my top five movies that I think we've reviewed so far in my opinion number five i think is escape from new york number four is the king of comedy number three is leaving las vegas number two is raging bull and number one brenton is wild wild west wow they're the best i think they're the top five now tell me your top five and then we're gonna have a little chat about them wow okay nathan i thought long and hard about this so i'll tell you my number five is chinatown okay my number four is seven samurai Uh uh-huh Number three is King of Comedy. All right. Number two is Network. Mm -hmm. And number one is It's a Wonderful Life. Ah, there we go. And you know what? If you've been listening to this show, I don't think these lists would sound that surprising. No, it, it, it wouldn't. That that was that was that was good, man. I'm so wow. That was very interesting. Well done. We we had one we had one film that doubled up on both of our we lists. We did an interesting King of Comedy. We both really loved King of Comedy. Yeah. And what was interesting, dude, was that I was tossing up whether to put Raging Bull or King of Comedy in that slot on my list because mm. uh, it was a Scorsese film for sure. I was debating whether to put Escape from New York or Network as my number five. And guess what else was cl- coming close to slotting in at number five for for funsies? Oh, what else? The film that I probably was it Wild Wild West. Uh, no, no, it was another one that I had a lot of fun with. It was Blade. Oh, same actually. I look back on Blade and I'm like, it's pretty good as well. Also, North by Northwest. I I really enjoyed. Same. That as that well. Actually, that, that's grown on me the more I think about it as well. But tell you what, Raging Bull used to be my favorite film, Brenton. Now it's Wild Wild West. Wow. And I stand by wow. it. It's so fucking good. 
Oh, watch Rod by Best Audience. Can you can you read your top five one more time? I just want to listen Escape to Escape from New York, King of Comedy, Leaving Las Vegas, which is also incredible, Raging Bull, wow. and Wild Wild West. That's the, I think that's the best five we've done so far. Leaving Las Vegas. Leaving Las Vegas. Wow. Wild Wild West is just fucking... It's a ride, isn't it? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a ride of a movie. It's literally... It's it's literally a ride at Movie World, guys. Oh, go, go it, it, it actually <laughs> is. Oh. And send me your five again. I just want to listen through that. Like, so number five was Chinatown. Yep. Number four, Seven Samurai. The first two I disagree with. Go on. King of Comedy. Yeah. Network. Yeah. And It's a Wonderful yep. Life. Top three I agree with. Seven Samurai. No. Chinatown. Absolutely, no. man. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah, man. I tell you what's a film that's been creeping up that I really want to watch again. What? That like this brought up that I've I really want to watch it again. And I was wondering if you'd watch it with me. It's actually The Last Temptation of Christ. Oh my God, Brenton. No, I'm not going to watch Last Temptation. Let's then talk about our worst five, Brenton. Let's go to the worst five. Okay, you take us away, buddy. All right, number five, The Last Temptation of Christ. <laughs> oh my goodness. No. Yes. <laughs> number four, Land Before Time. Oh, no. Number three, <laughs> Breakfast Club. <laughs> number two, Emerald City. And number okay. one, Cats. <laughs> Okay. Brenton, give me your worst top five. I don't think I've even still decided on my on my fifth one because, like, I've got three here at number well, five. Well, pick one and move on, Brenton. Just the first one that comes to your head that you hate the most. Okay, I'll, I'll pick I'll pick one. I'll pick The World Is Not Enough at number five. Oh, I bet yours is going to be all exclusively James Bond films, but continue. <laughs> no, no, that's 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 the only Bond film that oh, makes, okay. makes this list. Very no. well. Number no, number four, it's the castle. <laughs> oh fuck off! Gee, keep going. We'll talk. Number three is number three is Twister. Yep. Number two is Cats. There's something worse than Cats. What's number one? Emerald City. Ah. So you and I had Emerald City and Cats switched around. That's interesting. You know, you know. I originally had Cats as number one, but then I thought I got too much enjoyment out of watching you watch that. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. I guess if you watch it with a friend and just see them get slowly more and more irritated, I guess that's a good thing to get out of a movie. It's also it's also a fun thing to laugh at, to be fair. Emerald City is just it's boring. Look, the castle the castle's the one that I kind of had in there as a fuck you to Oh you, Stop after- it! Because it's a good movie! Ah, you're gonna watch it again, you're gonna change your mind. The other movie that was there for me was like Inspector Gadget that I wasn't sure. I was gonna put it on there, there as well, actually. Yeah, that was a close runner up. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um in fact Realistically, if I was not being so petty, Inspector Gadget would be there and there as well. But Babe Two also nearly made Same. it. Same. Babe Two was a runner up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was that was nearly in there. Read me your list. Okay. Again. So Last Temptation to Christ, number five. Oh no, Nathan. it's no Nathan, good, Nathan, Britain. No. And you and I, especially after seeing The Lighthouse, we know it's not good. Nathan, no. I, you look, gave it a thumbs I, down. I think there's something in there. I, yeah, but but I I don't think it's one of the worst films we've rev- oh, reviewed. Oh, easily. Come on. Like, God, it's such a drag. Inspector Gadget or Babe 2 deserves to be in there. No, no, nah, because of who was involved. They had fucking Willem Dafoe and Martin Scorsese, and this is what they produced. Willem Dafoe gives a pretty good performance, man. Number four, Land Before Time. It's no good either, Brenton. One of the worst, easily. Oh, Nathan, it, the more I think Nathan, about it, the more I on. hate it. <laughs> come on, Nathan. Oh. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Number three, Breakfast Club. Oh. Also, oh, one I hate, the more I think what about a- it. What a crime. What a crime, my oh, friend. Oh, sure. Is... Don't talk to me oh. about crimes, Brenton. Breakfast Club. What a waste. What a what a waste of two hours of my life just watching teenagers spurt the most cliche bullshit as they sit at detention. Ugh. I'm very upset, Nathan. But, you know, we agreed to disagree yeah. on this podcast. And I'm podcast. glad we agreed on Emerald and Cats. I'm glad we could both sit around that. Exactly. And and I th- and I think... And what's interesting about that is, is that Emerald was one of the first films we reviewed from Emerald. Yeah. I know, it was like our seventh episode or something like that. And we immediately were just like, geez. Yeah. Also, the sad thing is that was our first Aussie film that we reviewed. Yeah. What, what's funny though is as well is that the film after it made up for it, which was Network. Which I know, we went from one of the worst stuff, to so. one of the best. Jeez, what a fucking leave that was, I tell you what. So yeah, that, that was fun to kind of yeah. go through. And like maybe every year we'll, we'll update the list and see if anything tops those five, so... Here's his looking ahead, Brenton. I think so. Yeah, well, I think that's fun. Well, before we go, I think we should hand out some awards, Brenton. I think I think Let's we're, we're now we're now well into our 80s. I think we've now reached that maturity where we can start handing out some shitty trophies to Absolutely. Yeah. So, I thought this would be fun, you know. We well, we've got we got some ideas of some awards we could maybe do every year and I give them to move 2019 movies as a little congratulations. Absolutely. That sounds wonderful. And how we're going to do this is that Brent and I, we both pick something for this award. And what we're going to do is we're going to say who we think should win and then which of our two should be the winner and which one should be the runner up. 
So that's how it's going to go. Sounds good to me. All right. So Sounds first award. The first award is the best animal in a 2019 movie. What have you? Okay. What are you giving it to, Brendan? Nathan, the moment that I picked, the animal that I picked, isn't actually an animal. Oh. <laughs> Do you know how this award works? <laughs> it's otherwise known as a Pokemon. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that counts. Yeah. So I'm going to give it to Cubone from Detective Pikachu. Oh, for his little scene where he's like whacking up shop in the grass field, like, or when he's like, oh, or when what is it like? Um, not Jaden Smith, but essentially Jaden Smith is like clinging onto a cliff and he's like whacking the fingers and off. And he's knocking oh. in fingers off one by one. Yeah, I'm going to give it to Cubone. Though I nearly gave it to one of the cats from Cats, but I think that has to go to the worst animal of the year, Jeez. which would undoubtedly go to Judy Dench. <laughs> In in cats, that that is that is some horrifying shit, man. Oh man! I think the best animal in a 2019 movie is the dog from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, dude, that's a good choice. That's mm. a good choice. Because even though I don't adore that movie, I think that dog one does a great job, and two steals the movie at the end. That's 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 winning the award. There's no competition. That's the award. Oh, done. That's our that's our animal of the year. Oh, if you want to see a dog rip up shop, oh. That's good. Absolutely. Goodness me. Goodness me. Yes. Yes, please. Brenton, what do you think was the best kiss in a 2019 movie? The best kiss? Ooh, here we go, my friend. The best kiss of the year goes to a little film called Joker. Oh. And and it goes to the scene where Arthur Fleck goes onto the talk show and he waltzes in and he goes up to that doctor. Oh, yeah. And he just, that's he right. just mac, he just max on her face. Oh, that's a good kiss. That uh, my my blood was flowing during oh. that scene, and not because it was sexual or anything, oh. because I was going, "Holy fuck, this is this is this is." It really goes on, to the, the kiss as like, well. It's a very passionate kiss. It's a good yeah. kiss. Her reaction's priceless oh. as well. She's like, I love she kind of just goes with it as well. She's like, "Ooh, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah." But yeah, that's my pick. What about you, mate? I thought it was actually the kiss from Spider Man Far From Home between Peter and MJ. Oh yeah, that was because nice it's, it's one. In, in a very long time. It's probably the most wholesome kiss I've seen in a movie where you just see two teenagers who are a little bit scared about kissing each other, but they're gonna do it, and it's a nice sweet kiss. You know, it's it's what a first sure. sh- it's what a first kiss should be. You know, just that nice sweet. Hey, we like each other. This kind of confirms it. You know. What? So what's the best kiss then? I think it's the Joker one. I, I think too. I think I had a lot more fun with the Joker kiss, and I, 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 it makes me smile when I think about it. You know, Joaquin Phoenix when he's in prison, he's still probably kissing all the nurses out there. It it doesn't make me smile at all, but you know, I think <laughs> I think that's why I think that's why it's an interesting choice. As a little tangent, uh, the two characters I think that should have kissed but did not this year was our two leading leading characters from the Lighthouse. <laughs> You know how they have that. Oh my very- goodness! They, they, there's almost there's almost a moment where they almost kiss. They're so close to kissing. Exactly. At one point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that would have been a great kiss as well. But yeah, I I agree. I think I think yeah, we have to give it to um, Joker. Yeah. yeah. What a good time. All right, Brenton. I want to hand out award for the 2019 movie that should be in the MCU. This was a tough one, my this friend. This was very tough. What movie do I want to see in the MCU? They're going to be interacting. I want to see this movie set in MCU. And I really thought long and hard about this one. It's between two. And they're both pretty funny in their own ways. Okay. But now now that I'm here on the show, I know what I'm going to pick. Because just imagine that if Cats Brandon, was in the this. MCU. Brandon, was in the MCU. This. Nathan. Can you imagine if, like, you know, the Avengers assemble and fucking, like, Idris Elba as McCavities just, like, running along with his, oh like, army of little cockroaches, like, also running into battle against Thanos? Jesus. It no, would undermine Renton. everything. Like, that would make me walk out of a Marvel movie. And that, that, that's saying something. What's your selection, my friend? I think the movie that should be in the MCU is John Wick 3, Parabellum. Ooh, I haven't seen it, so I couldn't pick it, but that's that. I'd love to see John Wick. But in the I MCU. would love to see Keanu Reeves, John Wick, join the MCU. I think he'd be a fantastic member to the Avengers. I think he could probably also take down all the Avengers if need be. Exactly. He's a good, he's a good substitute for Black Widow. He just kind of slots right in there. You know, he, yeah, he, takes he can spot. take the place. You know, passing of the torch, and I think I think the jo- like this whole secret organization of assassins. It's it kind of matches the the kind of conspiracy thing of the MCU. I think it would work perfectly. Absolutely. So, which movie do we want to choose? Which one do we think should be in the MCU? Cats or Wick? I think that it should be John Wick. I think that Keanu in the MCU mm. is just the best fit. That sounds wonderful. I know I do not want to see those cats anywhere near the MCU, so they are definitely not winning. <laughs> yeah. Meow. Meow. Brenton, what was the best beard in a 2019 movie? This was a tough one. Mm. There were a lot of beards. We, we love a good beard on this podcast. Close runner-up was El Camino, was uh, Jesse Pinkman's beard at the Ooh, start of El Camino. He had a good beard, didn't he? Ooh. He had a dirty beard. Yeah, Very he's dirty. a good dirty beard. But uh, my pick is actually 
uh, going to go to the lighthouse. Oh, yeah, Willem Dafoe. Fwah. Willem Dafoe's masterful beard that he has in that film. Goodness me. that is Even that shout is out a- to Robert Patterson's Mo. Like, he rocks a good Mo Ooh, yeah. in this movie. He does. He, cool he looks mo. good in that film. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. But mo. God, yeah. Willem Dafoe, that's a proper old sailor's beer. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. Yeah. That beard. Oh, it could save lives. Brendan, my nomination for a 2019 beard actually comes from an animated movie that came out right at the start Does of this it? year. And my pick for um, a 2019 beard is for How to Train Your Dragon 3. I've seen this beard. And it has to it, be from it Hiccup. It looks pretty good. Hiccup's beard in How to Train Your Dragon 3 is extraordinary and maybe because it's animated it looks better than it would in real life but boy he looks so badass with that beard wow it's a good pick mm. it's a solid pick but out of the two i'm actually leaning more towards yours i really love willem defoe's i agree i was gonna fight for willem in that one yeah. i think i think it was a i think it's a really and i want to see him yeah. wear that beard more in future roles and you know do you think he'd work as green goblin with that beard still i think he could i think he could pull it off i think he could pull it off but like an aged green goblin like if he came back in the fourth spider-man then yes i think it would work yeah agreed agreed brenton what was the best death in a 2019 movie again this was a tough one and it was between the lighthouse was actually a nomination for me for this one uh, oh, yeah. for a great death scene of uh spoilers for lighthouse of willem dafoe when he when he gets buried alive and then he comes back and he Jeez. gets axed to the face i can't believe he d- get, delivers that monologue with dirt in his face like Jeez, that must oh have been difficult. God, amazing- he alone should get an Oscar for that. Will- Willem's probably my performance of the year so far, to be honest. How fucked up is Robert Patterson's corpse, though, at the end? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Jeez. Oh, yes. Now that's a death. Uh, so, uh, my because that's out of the equation, there's plenty of deaths in The Irishman as well that could fill this slot that I thought were good oh, deaths. Yeah. But my death of the year has to go to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood <gasps> when Leo DiCaprio pulls out his flamethrower and tortures the Manson girl in the pool. Brenton, the stars have aligned because that was also my pick for the best <laughs> death in 2019. <laughs> Uh, it's, oh. it's it's poetry, Nathan. It there we itself. go. Unanimous, Brenton. We both agree on that. So we'll give the runner up then to Willem Dafoe. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Good oh. on you, Willem. Brenton, what's the best 2019 movie? Well, for me, this was easy. This became very apparent. It's actually The Lighthouse for me. Um, I think I think Ooh. The Lighthouse is the best film I watched this year for sure. I think mm. I think it's an incredible film. I'm I'm so excited to watch it again. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for me, it's the best thing I saw that came out this year for sure. Same. I I was about to put on Lighthouse. No, 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 no. I, no, I, I, I didn't. I, thought you I didn't say wow. I was like, I didn't. But like, I, it's very close for me because I love Lighthouse a lot. But I think I love Marriage Story just that little bit more. We didn't talk about Marriage Story. Oh shit, we did it. I forgot. We haven't talked about Marriage Story great, at all. This is, a, this is a great point in time. This is to it. This is the it. moment. <laughs> Let's talk about Marriage Story because it's fucking incredible, Brenton. It's obviously your film of the year, so you take us away. It's what amazing. Do you think of, uh, Marriage Story. It's amazing. This is. This is the best I've seen Scarlett Johansson. This is the best I've seen Adam Driver. Adam Driver. Jesus, that is acting. That is acting. Him and Willem are going to be the two front runners for the Oscar. Because, like, jeez, that is amazing. The The scene where, where he's arguing with Scarlett Johansson, they try and talk out the divorce, like, halfway through the movie. And he's, like, bloody opening cupboard doors and shutting them. And he eventually falls to her knees and cries. That scene alone is maybe the best scene I've seen all year. Wow. It's high it's, praise. High it's praise. amazing. Laura Dern is outstanding in this. You know, Ray Liotta is amazing in this as like the, the Yeah, the, yeah. He's so good. Everyone's so good. Like, oh, I love this movie. It's it, like Scarlett Johansson's family is great. Every scene that's in this movie needs to be there. It's balanced. You can really start with either character in this. It's so insightful about the divorce industry and about just how, how complicated a divorce is and how the law intervenes and just Oh, it's beautifully shot. It's so sharply written. It's it's the soundtrack is is outstanding. It's what it's. I download the soundtrack immediately after this movie because it's so fucking good. There is not a single incorrect decision made with this movie, and it is easily the best movie of the year. Nathan, that's very that's very high praise. Uh, look, I agree with most of what you said. For me. Uh, technically, it's pretty, pretty bloody fantastic. It's pretty, it's pretty well faultless, like you said. I think the performances are, are, are very, are very good. I, I think Adam Driver just can, continues to impress me. I, I just think he's one of the best actors. He's one of the best oh. actors, young actors working today. I think, I think he's really, really strong. Scarlett Johansson for me, I've never really warmed to her as an actor for mm. whatever reason. I've never watched her in a film and and loved her performance. Like, like there's a lot of performance that I like her in, but there's. For some, for some reason, me and Scarlett, it just has never seen eye to eye, and I've never been wowed by her. I thought she was really good in this, though. Um, 
Again, I, there's always a bit of a disconnect I have with Scarlett Johansson for some reason, which I, I don't, that's that's a me thing that I probably need to get over. And I don't know what that comes from. And I'd like <laughs> to unpack that a bit more maybe one day. Watch um watch Match Point and watch Lost in Translation if you want to get over Scarlett. I need to watch Lost in Translation, but like, I just, I'm just not sure I quite get it yet with her. Um, but again, mm. she was, she was fantastic in this and their chemistry made the film work basically. This film's got some like awesome moments. There's a scene where Adam Driver sings a song. And uh, I thought that was a really, really great moment. I like that it kind of elevates and we go into the theatre kind of world, which is referenced a lot in the mm. film. I think Laura Dern's really solid. I think Ray Liotta's really solid. All the supporting cast is actually really solid in this movie. Uh, it's well shot. It's well directed. It's well acted. Like you said, the soundtrack's mm. really good. Uh, for me, it's just, it's just, it's just a. Uh, again, this is a, this is a. Um, personal thing and for me it's just it's this isn't the best movie of the year for me but oh. i can understand why it's your best movie of the year i want to defend it Brendan. i think the story's better i think this film has more to say than lighthouse even though lighthouse i i, I could almost argue that like that the lighthouse is a better film than it is a movie i think it really embraces the film medium probably more than marriage story but i think what i what i would recommend more to people i would oh it's tough they're both so excellent i'd recommend both but I don't know. I've, oh, I feel like the film I'm going to think more and more about is probably going to be Marriage Story. And even though I will think about Lighthouse, I think Marriage Story also is going to inform me a lot more about relationships than, than probably Lighthouse will. Yeah, I'm with well, Lighthouse for me. It's a. Uh it's I think I, I'm excited to watch it again for me just after watching it like there's a lot that I impacted with it it's it's kept it's it's kept me really thinking is is what I'd say and that's why I appreciate it the most it's it's um I, I'd recommend it to a lot of people I think it's quite accessible for being a film you know what I mean like uh oh. I, I think people will watch it and enjoy those performances and I and, and I think that like they're very they're both very human performances i think obviously it's in black and white um which might throw people off but i think the story is one of those stories that people will be invested in and 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 really nah, get something out of when i know uh, if come on if you were to think really of what people would watch the netflix film of marriage story or the black and white one-to-one ratio of Willem Dafoe and robert Pattinson stuck in a lighthouse that's surrealist like there's no competition as to which one would be more accessible uh, I don't know, man. Like the people I've personally spoken to about Marriage Story, whilst it's had this universal acclaim, have not been impressed by it <laughs> overall. They've been like, "Oh, that was boring," and I was like, "Well, okay, you know, oh. like I, I I enjoy it, but like again, it's not something I'd be like, well, best best picture, you know." What Maybe I mean? we're gonna have to be divided, Brenton. Maybe I don't think you and I are gonna agree on this. Uh, uh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. We, that's again, the service we, we both love obviously. Marriage Story. We both love Lighthouse, but we, I just don't think we can put one above the other. No, no, no. maybe not. But, and that's okay. but maybe the worst 2019 movie will brenton because even even though i haven't seen it you've sold me immediately it has to be cats it's cats it's cats, cats, cats. Is the worst film of the yeah, year easy. Yep. not even Absolutely. a competition there's no argument there's no argument it's worth it's worth watching though it's worth watching no, it's to see not. this moment in cinema no it's worth watching to see this moment in cinematic history where this colossal achievement in fuck uppery happened you know what i mean like it's oh, just it's it's a sight to behold. The last awards, Brenton, is that we I want to we we want to hand out an award for the best movie we just happened to watch this year. So <laughs> whether this was inside the podcast, outside the podcast, we put on a film. What's the best movie that you've watched this year, dude? I'm going to pick a film that we watched on the podcast. It was a tough one because I nearly put Lighthouse for this as well because I was so happy with it and I was like, oh man, that's what I want to feel when I go to the cinema in today's day and age. So I thought it was important for that. Um, mm. And I thought it was a worthy choice in that sense as well. But for me, I'm going to go with The King of Comedy is the best movie I've watched this wow. year. Wow. I mean, I, I don't... I mean, I, that's not my pick, but I, I so am on board with that. I think it is extraordinary. The more I think about it as well, the more I love it as well. For me, it might be Scorsese's best. One of my, my personal favourite of Scorsese's. I, it's, it's up there for me with a, with a few select others. Um, and the fact that I've watched that this year and, it, and it's gone straight up there, and I should have watched it ages ago. And it, it's, I'm so glad that we got to review that on the podcast. Mm. But um, it's something real, really special, guys. And um, I think it's a special performance from De Niro as well. And um, it's funny. It's thought-provoking. It's dramatic. It's it's everything a movie should be. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's it's entertaining. It's it's great. Brenton, my pick for this year, um, it's a film from 1968. Oh, it's a Spanish film, and it's called The Party. You you've mentioned to this this to me uh, before, but it yeah. keeps going. I think off air, and what the premise it is, it's easily the best movie I've seen this year. And I don't know if it is for everyone, but what it is, it's about um about of aristocratic or the bourgeois kind of um class of Spanish people in Spain. And they're throwing this party, and it goes like all night. They pull like an all nighter, and it goes off. And they're all about they're all about middle aged, and it's all a bunch of couples. And they realize for whatever reason that they actually can't 
leave the room that they're partying in. Every time they try and leave the room, they just somehow they think of something else to do instead. And so they keep staying in the room. And the film just escalates into madness from there. And it is so genius. And it's probably the best deconstruction on class I've seen in the movie so far. I haven't seen Parasite, sadly. Wow. But it is so sharp on what it has to say about class. The performances are outstanding. And even though it's in Spanish, even though it's like shot way back in the day, like I think it still looks gorgeous. And it sounds beautiful and i think and just the horror and just the 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 deprecation these characters go through it is moving and i finished the film and i just can't stop talking about this movie to people i know it it it, i think about it consistently and just and it's it fucks your mind like oh and what and at the and the ending of this film as well and it's funny and it's sad like it's it's a great time and you and if you can find a copy of it i i implore you to do it because 1968's the party well i'll definitely have to check it yeah, out it's a good um, time you've you've sold me Nathan. yeah it sounds good brenton what's the worst movie you happen to watch this year <laughs> mate it's cats, it's cats. <laughs> like it's it's, it's, cats. <laughs> it's cats sorry like it it kind of that overshadows everything it really does. you know what i mean that that there's no there's no competition brenton i haven't book, i haven't so. seen cats so the actual movie i watched the worst one i watched this year and <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this i can tell was moulin rouge moulin rouge is in ba- bez Luhrmann's moulin rouge yes by a mile why, why was it bad? it's just tell so me. terrible it's got the most almost as, you know what there's a lot of parallels with cats it's got the most bare bones plot it has it has the most outrageous musical numbers it's it's so ludicrous it's so hyper realized i feel like the whole movie's on cocaine and like it's just got nothing to say. The act, the performances are god awful across the board. And like it's, it, I just I watched it with my friend Michaela. She came over one night and then we just said let's watch Moulin Rouge, uh, Rouge, and we couldn't finish it. We got like maybe an hour in and we both turned and we said we uh, we physically cannot do this anymore. At least you finished Cats, but then again you were in a cinema. It's horrendous. D- do you, are you a fan of this movie? Yeah, I really like Moulin Rouge. Why? <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> what is going on that movie? And everyone's trying to like everyone's trying to s- movie. everyone's trying to have sex with the cold Nick Kidman, and she's being f- f- intimidated and scared, and everyone's just like laughing and giggling and fucking Jim Broadbent as like the because the, because, oh. because Moulin Rouge like killed the award season that year, and it was it's very was very well received and was very popular. And for me, it's like Baz Luhrmann's love letter to the to the musical film. Like, oh, it's, I feel it's like this a, would be an amazing I, I stage good. show, but as a film, Jesus, it's just. I had no idea what the I fuck was really going good. on the whole movie. I'm like, what is happening? It feels like the weirdest mind trip. I will agree that it's cinema in excess. Like, I agree with that. But ah. I think that's part of its charm. And, and I, I think at its core, it's this very kind of simple love story between these uh, between two great lead actors. That's what... I, I haven't seen it in a couple of years, but... Oh, I Jesus. watch it every now and then, and I, and I really enjoy it. I don't know when that thing turns 20 years. I don't think we're going to review it, because I do not want to watch that shit again. But boy, does it not hold up in 2019, <laughs> and that's my thesis well, I, for this podcast. I definitely uh, disagree, and I've always really liked Moulin Rouge, and uh, I probably will continue to do so. It makes me want to watch it again, actually, because I need to watch it again to be like, well, maybe oh, maybe I'm out of touch. But, uh, I watched it a couple years back, and I still had a great time. Nah, nah. No, and I've seen posters for this movie for years, like in schools and in like I don't know fucking bedrooms. I don't know, and like and there's people praise it, and I finally sat down to watch it, and it like died, like it withered and it died on its first gasp of air, <laughs> Brenton, and like oh, I've just haven't been able to forgive it since. Well, Nathan, we agree to disagree once again this uh, episode. That's all of our awards. That's all of it. And Brenton, that was 2019 in review. That was 2019 in wow. review. What a what a year, Brenton! What a year of, of cinema! <laughs> what a year that was, twenty nineteen! And thank you, our listeners, for sticking with oh, us for twenty nineteen, especially for this episode. And, uh, arguably, probably the longest we've done. <laughs> <laughs> arguably the longest. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see in the end. But uh, guys, uh, for us, twenty nineteen was a fantastic year. Yeah. But going forward, twenty twenty, it is going to be even. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have seen yet, but. If you do, and if you would, you can check out our Instagram we page. We have an which Instagram is now. Spanking oh. new. Ooh, Nathan. Brendan, it's so it's shiny. All set up. We're gonna shake up. We're gonna shake up um the podcast. Cause our cause our goal for this year is that we wanna hear more from you. We wanna talk to you more. We wanna get involved with you more. So we're bloody shaking up the social media. Check out our Instagram. It's in yep. all the links below. Um we've got a brand new YouTube, check it out. We got a 
we got the, we, we oh we now have the one Twitter. So rather than talk to Brett Snort and me, we thought it'd be easier just having the one account and just chatting on that. The one account, keep it easier. But yeah, we, we're across all these social platforms. And the reasons that they're there is because we want to interact with you guys and for you to interact with us, obviously, and tell us what you think about, well, this episode. There was a lot of opinions thrown around here yeah. about our future mo- film reviews, about our past film reviews, anything you want to talk about or if any suggestions you want to, if you want to suggest episodes for us, like that'd be fantastic as well. Or give us your top sevens and various things that we list in our seasonal seven episodes. You know, the point is, is that we're an open book and we want to talk to you guys and, and keep this conversation going outside of just this show. And also great news, if you look in the links below, We've got a bunch of new outlets, so you can obviously you can catch the podcast on the usual Apple Podcast app, YouTube, and SoundCloud. But now, Brenton, we're also on Spotify. We are finally. Woo-hoo. We've been requested it for so long. We're finally up, and also we're on a bunch of other stuff. So check out all the things below on, on which service you like to use. And yeah, you can contact us out there. And, and when you're on the service, it would mean so much to us if you could chuck us a like or a nice review or just even a comment just to say hello because we'd love to have a chat and talk to you about movies. You know, obviously we love chatting about movies and hopefully you do too. Yeah, guys, 2020 is going to be the year of classic movie banter. Oh, I can feel it. I can feel it in my bones. It's going to be a great year. I can feel it. And uh, thank you for all that you've done for us so far. And thank you for what you will hopefully continue to do for us in the future. We love you guys. And without you guys, there would be no classic movie banter. So we appreciate appreciate you Much we love. love you and we can't wait to see more of you in the future well brenton let's 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 get out of here and then make sure you don't go upstairs to check out that light says oi <laughs> well here's an axe nathan and uh you know what happens at the end of the lighthouse oh no <laughs> quick i gotta use my tentacles see if that can save me <laughs> ah! jesus that was dark <laughs>